you know, we have been trying to present the water set model models that it is a type of things you should have an integrated path with an understanding about the farmers that you manage with the small water that is flowing to a, your area, free of the water from uh, the rainy season, so that at least two, three hundred crops you can do. But the thing is that when food security is, is an issue, making these farmers to produce other than paddy or the food grain has been a challenge, but we have been trying our best to increase that. Yes, there are many areas less rainfall in this field. Yes. In those areas, maybe better ideas from the village, exactly. Bakra, okay, and all other sectors. The thing is that the village has been made. Sir, the village has been tried in other states previously also. Millets has a big potential because it has practically the demand for it. It is a demand that that is driving international demand that is driving millets also. So farmers have been very uh, when it has been a profitable proposition for many farmers in recent year to shift to millets. But the thing is that sir, we are always in short term of with pulses, specifically pulses and oil seeds that they, uh, they have been the products of demand. Anyway, sir, pulses, oil seeds have put uh, the country in difficulties and there have been good rewards for the better pulses and better oil seeds. But the issue remains. The seeds are not properly means the seeds are not available for pulses and oil seeds in proper form. The way we address paddy or some other crop, we don't address pulses and oil seeds in that way. Anyway, millet has come as a added uh, uh, giving added advantage, and uh, it will it will practically add to this benefit stream of the farmers. Sir, I think uh, I have. So, uh, means what we have been practicing, that is the only thing we can say at this point, sir. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. A big hand for Sri DP Das, everyone. DP presented on the major rights in agricultural development and uh, the vaccine issues in agriculture, never playing a vital role in rural development and agriculture. It was uh, really nice hearing you, sir. Moving ahead, we have a very uh, special uh, speaker with us, Professor Robert Henry. He is uh, talking on the application of genomics to the sustainable use of plant biodiversity for food and energy. Sir is uh, joined. Sir, sir uh, is already, uh, already with us from the University of Queensland, Australia. Let's give a big hand to welcome Professor Robert Henry. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to talk to you today. I'll begin by uh, sharing my uh, sharing my screen. So today, today I'd like to talk to you about uh, application of genomics to sustainable um, use of plants for food and energy. Uh, the key message is that uh, the analysis of the genetics of plants with genome technology is a, something that contributes substantially to the biological understandings that are really the key to both plant breeding, but also the uh, use and management of our crops because we understand their biology better and the way in which we achieve the attributes that uh, ensure we meet the requirements of our consumers in the market. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of the big objectives of, of my research program, which include capturing plant biodiversity to improve food security. And here we really look at uh, capturing that variation that exists in the wild relatives of crops and bringing it in uh, to the gene pool so that we can have a greater range of, of crops but even going beyond that and domesticating completely new plant species so that we've got 
uh, more secure future for food because we've got a greater range of plants that we can use. And the other big area that genomics contributes to enormously is our ability to uh, reduce uh, climate change by uh, engineering plants to actually replace fossil carbon. So there are many uh, things for which we will need carbon into the future, and we need to have a renewable source uh, to replace fossil carbon, and plants are really the only option, and we need to fast track that if we're going to meet our targets for uh, climate uh, uh, change mitigation. Uh, climate change by uh, engineering plants to actually replace fossil carbon. So there are many uh, things for which we're looking. I, I, I'm not sure. And we need to have a renewable source uh, to replace fossil fuel. So uh, what I was going to um, when just talk about is, is the, the fact that the, all of the diversity we have in plants can be and is being systematically uh, searched to find the new sources of food uh, that we can capture from uh, the great diversity, for example, of flowering plants that we have. And the technology that's enabling us to do that really is the great advances in genetic technology. Here we depict the, the cost of sequencing the genome, and this is based on the human genome. And we can see that this has dramatically collapsed over the years. The real key message is that this process is continuing. It's getting cheaper all the time. Uh, we've moved from uh, when this was uh, drawn at $1,000 to sequence a human genome, now to more like $100. And we're going to expect within the course of 2023 that the cost of sequencing platforms, some of the long-range sequencing platforms, will decrease more than tenfold. So we're going to see a, a dramatic uh, revolution in this technology and its ability to contribute uh, to agriculture. We've been tracking some of these developments, particularly as they've accelerated after over the last uh, two years or so by comparing all of the available technologies and seeing how we can use that to analyze uh, our crop uh, genetics. And what uh, has emerged is that we can actually uh, assemble the whole chromosome uh, now from uh, just the DNA sequence analysis alone. If we go back to 2020, uh, we were quite often getting uh, lots of little pieces that made up the chromosome and it was a challenge uh, to completely sequence and assemble the genetic sequence of especially complex plants. But that's no longer the case. We can now do this quite quickly. And this revolution means that we can really accelerate the use of uh, DNA-based technology uh, in supporting uh, plant breeding and agriculture more generally. Uh, we've written a few reviews on that that I'd refer you to, to to get a sense of the way the technology is changing and will change even so dramatically uh, in, in the course of 2023. I'd like to talk about some of the applications of that to give you a sense of how we see uh, this impacting into the future. Uh, and we've been looking at the question of how we reinvent rice. And rice really is and remains one of the really important uh, crops in the world. Uh, and we do need uh, to uh, adapt to the changing climate uh, and the changing needs of consumers uh, in this area. And we've been uh, looking widely at the diversity. Uh, and if we look at the, the wild uh, relatives of uh, domesticated Asian rice, they extend from here in Northern Australia up to China and across to India. And there is really quite a lot of diversity there, but it's largely underutilized. We haven't uh, to any great extent exploited that, that diversity and we need to begin to do that if we're going to keep pace uh, with, uh, with changes in climate and changes in, in demand for food. We look at the genetic relationships between the domesticated rices. We get a family tree that looks a bit like this. We've got um, probably about seven different groups of rices uh, that are grown in different regions around the world. And we really had uh, a great conflict uh, of ideas about how we got to this point. How many times did we separately domesticate rice uh, in different countries, in India, in, in China, in, in other places? And we've uh, ma managed to throw some light on that question by, by looking at the sequence recently of about 3,000 rices that have domesticated rices that have been looked at closely. And we found that they really fall into just two groups. All of the rices uh, 
uh, suggest that uh, they only have the same maternal genome, or well, this is the case, it's the chloroplast genome. What that tells us basically is so rice has two mothers, but it has many fathers because we can see uh, uh, many different types of rice around the world. So what's happened, I think, is in the past, uh, in the deep past, there have been two fundamental domestications of rice at two different places. And those rices have been transported and transferred around the world. And in the places where they've been taken, they've interbred with the local rices to actually become almost identical to the rices or the wild rices of those regions. But they still bear um, that signature of those two original maternal domestications. So I think the, the statement there really summarizes what we now understand. But what it tells us is there's a great opportunity to begin that process again uh, from other uh, wild sources of diversity and to produce rices that may have very much the attributes that we want uh, for the future. And so we're looking uh, across uh, all of the rices, not only in Asia, but Africa, Australia and, and South America to find uh, the attributes that we need for the future. In Australia, we have uh, some very divergent species. We have uh, the more, most divergent of, of the close relatives of rice, which is a strange thing to say, but we have the most divergent species that are still interfertile with domesticated rice. So they provide the greatest source of genetic variation. Uh, and so we're trying to conserve these species and make them available uh, for rice improvement. The species uh, right across the north and down the east coast, and these species have been consumed, of course, by humans for a very long period of time. These cave paintings uh, in, in the north, in the areas where we find the rices, uh, uh, predate uh, any agriculture anywhere in the world. So there's been a long period of human use of these, and we are interested in the extent to which humans have, have altered the genetics of, of rice uh, without even domesticating. We do find uh, in areas that we see in the wild uh, hybridization happening naturally, uh, what so-called reticulate evolution, where uh, rice evolves by the species being dispersed around the tropics and diverging. But we've now found evidence that they also uh, interbreed. And those rare events of hybridization between the species play a key role in shaping uh, the species that we see today. And uh, it's interesting to see that we can find evidence of that ongoing in the wild and some of the wild and undisturbed populations that we have in the extreme north of Australia. These, these represent great opportunities here. Um, grain B is a wild rice, whereas E is a domesticated rice. We have the potential to have bigger seeds and seed size is a major component of, uh, of grain yield. So we've got uh, very directly opportunities to improve rice performance by accessing the genetics that exists in the wild. Uh, these wild rices also have uh, great uh, nutritional attributes in that they have uh, starches that are more slowly digested. And uh, the, there's the suggestion that they may enable the production of rice that's healthier for communities that, ex that consume uh, relatively large amounts of rice. And that's an increasing challenge uh, in modern uh, Asian communities. Uh, another example uh, of this is sorghum. Sorghum was domesticated in Africa, but all of the diversity in the genus is found, or, or most of it, uh, in northern Australia, where we have uh, more than 20 of the 23 species of sorghum. Uh, and we're now beginning uh, to look at that. We have uh, very diverse types of potential new cereals here that could uh, broaden uh, our genetic base and improve food security. And so we're working on studying the relationships of those in collaboration uh, with the Joint uh, Genome Institute in, uh, in the US. And we're beginning to understand uh, where we can capture new and important variation uh, for much larger step changes in the genetic improvement of sorghum, which is one of those crops that does cope with warm and dry environments. And so is likely to become a crop uh, of even greater importance in the future. We see great advances, not only in the field crops, but also in the horticultural crops. And these uh, species are ones that we're targeting for advanced genomics uh, applications at the moment. These are the uh, eight key species that are of uh, are local economic importance for us, but they're also very important in many cases uh, internationally. We've produced uh, a high quality 
genome for avocado, which will probably renew interest in genetic improvement uh, of this, uh, this crop. Uh, we've uh, just completed sequencing 11 species of uh, citrus that represent great new sources of diversity for citrus breeding. Citrus faces some major new diseases in the world, and we need uh, to find genetic solutions quickly to be able to retain uh, the levels of citrus production that we've had. And sequencing these genomes in these genetic maps, we're able to find uh, a great diversity of disease resistance genes in the wild. And we know the wild species are resistant to these diseases that are, that are threatening production. And with this knowledge now, we can very readily transfer that resistance uh, into uh, a domesticated citrus and really uh, uh, meet the challenge of these major new diseases. The mango is another one. We're working with people uh, in India and New Delhi on this, but also uh, in other places in the world on, on different varieties. And in mango, we've been sequencing much of the wild diversity. And what we've discovered uh, remarkably, I think, is that mango, uh, many of the mango wild uh, varieties, so wild species, seem to have been uh, subject to interbreeding with domesticated mango. Mango was domesticated a long time ago and wild and domesticated mangoes have grown together probably for thousands of years. And it's not surprising that we see now evidence that there's been gene flow in both directions. Our domesticated mangoes have contributed significantly to many of the species that we find in the wild. And this is going to give us a much better basis on which to undertake uh, genetic improvement of, of mango. Uh, one species I wanted to mention because of its unique uh, contribution is the jojoba. This is a plant that comes from the desert in America. Uh, it's very uh, much uh, of interest to people in Saudi Arabia that are supporting us to do this research. And where here we sequenced the male and female plant. Uh, a small proportion of plants are dioecious, that is, they have a separate male and female plant. And uh, but in, remarkably, no one had sequenced the complete genome of a male and female. And here we did it for the first time, and we found a, a Y chromosome in the male uh, that was. Uh, much bigger than the one in the female. Uh, we're talking about 10 million bases of genetic code greater in the, in, the, in the male. And in humans, the difference between males and females is quite small, maybe 27 genes. We found a, a much bigger difference between the male and female jojoba plant. This greater sexual dimorphism was not only associated with the different flowers that you get on a male and female, but in different responses to stress. So what this says is male and female plants have been able to evolve separately down different paths to adapt to the stresses of their environment in quite different ways. And this has given us, uh, I think, many more clues, uh, not only about reproductive biology in plants and how we can manipulate that uh, in desirable ways, but about how plants have an, a range of different ways they can respond to stress. Uh, and, uh, and so much of that is going to be useful, particularly from this species that, that grows in desert conditions and provides a whole lot of clues about options we can consider in major crops. Coffee is another species that's, that's benefiting enormously from this. Uh, we've had the expectation that, that coffee is under threat in the wild and uh, changing climates mean that the places where we produce high quality coffee are probably not going to be able to continue to produce that into the future with uh, critical temperatures at high altitude changing where we get the best coffee. We need to go back to the wild and there is great diversity there. And the sequencing that we've done in coffee and its wild relatives is providing a platform for us to uh, continue to produce coffee of the quality that consumers want into the future. I think we'll see the same with other major beverage crops uh, like tea. In addition to sequencing, the other big technology that's really important to understand is, is gene editing. Uh, this is a technology that allows us, once we understand uh, what, what we have, it, to change it to suit the needs of, of farmers and consumers. And so we're trying to use this to understand how plants adapt to the environment with our Centre for, for Plants Success. But we're, we're also trying to understand how uh, things evolve when plants were domesticated, how the networks of genes have been changed by humans and how we can uh, manipulate that further or how we can go back and domesticate new things. One of the great examples of, of this 
Uh, and the importance of this is fragrance in rice. Um, back up in about 2005, in, in, in my lab, we discovered the gene for fragrance in, in basmati and jasmine rice uh, by having available to us a complete rice genome sequence for the first time. And that revealed that the, there was a mutation, a loss of function of a gene uh, that led to the fragrant molecule, but that that was also associated uh, with a loss of plant stress response. Fragrant plants by necessity were more susceptible to drought and to salt stress because of the loss of this biochemical pathway that was associated with fragrance. By knowing that, we're now able to think about deliberately uh, engineering the plant to both be fragrant and to cope with stress. But it's a great example of how, how human selection and natural selection sometimes are conflicting. But if we understand it, we can address it and get a better outcome uh, for farmers and for plant production. So we're very much focused on characterizing domestication genes in wild relatives and using genome editing. And in rice, we're using that to undertake a de novo domestication of new Arisa species, but to also improve nutritional quality traits and disease resistance in rice that's, that's able to be rapidly enhanced. This is going to lead to domestication of new crops. Here's a, a, a wild millet that we're pursuing this in, and uh, this species of rice is a target for uh, de novo domestication as well. We've been working through the desert areas of Australia with the indigenous people and the archeologists trying to understand the plants that were consumed by humans in the tens of thousands of years there's been humans uh, living in those areas. And in many cases where we believe there were large populations, but what we really don't know is what they were eating. We want to learn that because some of those plants might be opportunities for the future. Uh, maybe when we have climates similar to what we had uh, 50,000 years ago when this sort of food production began. So we're looking to capture biodiversity within the Australian flora from everything from rice to citrus in this list and, and, uh, and many more. And I think the same approach can be taken globally to enriching the diversity of plants we have in agriculture. So the other point I wanted to speak uh, briefly on is the use of um, plants to replace fossil carbon to fill this critical role in decarbonizing the world. And this is uh, how we use plants to produce all those things that we produce from, from, from fossil carbon. It's not just transport that we use and, and fuel that we use uh, oil for. We use a, a lot of oil, in fact, more oil to produce products, plastics, chemicals, all those other things, fabrics. And we do need long-term a solution to that if we're going to, going to reduce our reliance on fossil carbon. So this involves uh, a fairly significant consideration of how we balance the application of genetics to food security, energy security, and of course, continuing to conserve the biodiversity we need to sustain the environment and to sustain the genetic resources on which agriculture depends. And this is a book I wrote back in 2010, trying to rationalize the challenges that those uh, three objectives create for us. But really we're interested now in engineering plants to uh, have a biomass composition that allows us to uh, produce uh, biomaterials and uh, things like aviation fuel. The electrification of, of ground transportation means that we're less likely to need this for cars in the future. Many of us now have electric cars and many more will have electric cars in the near future. And so we need to focus our efforts with plants on the, the needs of things like long distance flight. And here we've got a program to do that and on the production of uh, things other than fuel that we can't replace in other ways. And the two big targets that we have are sugarcane, uh, and sugarcane is the most uh, produced crop in the world, and eucalypts, which are the most planted trees in the world and representing a woody biomass that's storable. Uh, they're two big global opportunities that we're applying genomics to. In sugarcane, uh, we've been uh, working with the, the sugarcane genome for a very long time, and uh, this is a, the reason that this uh, species has been such a challenge is that it's the most genetically complex probably of all crop plants. It's the last of the 20 major crops in the world to have its genome completely sequenced. But I can say that we're about to report that the, the sequence has been completed, uh, particularly in collaboration uh, again with the Joint Genome Institute. And so this genome will be available and we will be able to say that all of the major crops in the world have 
uh, have a reference genome we can use to support uh, genomic breeding. We've also developed a whole lot of technologies to manipulate the composition. And, and one is uh, sorghum mutants, working with the Carlsberg Research Laboratories uh, with a major program there. We've developed a very large population of mutant, mutant sorghums that can be screened to find a mutation in any gene of interest and to test the phenotype. So we are able to systematically now look at every gene in the genome and understand its function. And by doing that uh, in, uh, in sorghum, a uh, very close relative of, of, of sugarcane, we should be able to then translate that genetics uh, into producing uh, the energy crops we need for the future. And this high throughput mutagenesis uh, has, has been successful to date in finding uh, mutations in every gene we've been looking for very quickly because we pre-prepare the population and have the DNA available for screening and can find the plant within a matter of days. The same with the eucalypt. Uh, these trees uh, uh, are um, something we've been able to sequence the genomes of and found in the different lineages, remarkable processes of co uh, parallel evolution. These two groups of eucalypts diverged 65 million years ago, but remarkably have chromosomes with very similar genes. And so we now uh, expect that we'll be able to, uh, in the longer term, manipulate uh, the genomes of these to be uh, ideal replacements for fossil carbon. So I think just by, uh, uh, and by thanking all the, the very many uh, key collaborating laboratories that have been involved in the work I've, been, I've touched on in, in, in this talk, and, and to thank the many uh, collaborators working in the lab that have done uh, all of that research. Uh, thank you very much.
but we are just replacing nucleotides so there is no worry for antibiotic i know from the which thread you are asking this nowadays we are discussing everywhere there is no threat any other yeah sir Okay. Mm -hmm. It is a, it is a, it is really great suggestion, uh, and that is the reason, sir. We have now the mission. It is called FUNI Security: Food, Health, Nutrition, Energy, and Environment Security. And I have I have seen one. Uh, what is called suggestive letter to honorable prime minister on that area very recently yep especially in the case of uh, the health the health issue mm -hmm. uh, so mention also the diabetes pressure blockages these are the main Ignorances of human interference, yep. the human activity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, if you can all through genome intervention in agriculture, mm -hmm. that will be a great uh, uh, help to the human society, to the world as a whole. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I will take a couple of minutes, particularly from Dr. Bansal, because he is in a hurry. He is to attend another meeting. Uh, uh, I share one incident from you, uh, from uh, from my first experience. I will share one uh, one incident with you. That is when uh, my wife remembers would uh, definitely remember when Dr. Borlaug was on bed with cancer. Okay. Uh, he used to blindly love me. I don't know why I don't have that uh, credential at all. So he told me, Chitto, enough is uh, enough uh, in molecular evolution and fundamental basic uh, science. You do something which is of immediate need of the society. I asked, sir, what you suggest me? He told, why not cancer? He was suffering from cancer then, okay? And immediately we wrote one research project, submitted to USDA NIFA program, and without any review, just from concept note, it was approved. So blessings from Dr. Burlog, or this is needed for the society, God knows, but that work we did. Sir, as you know, Bitter melon is not only bitter gourd in India, it not only having anti-diabetic principles, it is having also many anti-cancer products. We, we did some good work on that by molecular breeding, but you are absolutely right. That must be included in genomic designing strategy. Yes, it is a great, great suggestion. Any other from the seniors? Now I feel comfortable. Okay, thank you very much for your patient hearing and I thank the organizer again and I am very thankful to the students of Centurion University. I envy you because you got such a good scope to be in this great, great campus. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you so very much, sir, for the great presentation on the reasons and reasons of next generation.
small change in the increased concentration of carbon dioxide. And what about oxygen? Oxygen, oxygen concentration in blue. Is anaerobic earth, there's no oxygen, okay? Around 2 billion, 2.5 billion of years ago, evolved cyanobacteria or bluegin algae, which broke water to form oxygen in the process of photosynthesis. So oxygen concentration atmosphere increased, and this oxygen atmosphere is photosynthetic oxygen that has increased from 0.01% to today's 20.9%, okay? And what happened methane? The gas were all took out, dread, get dreadful gas were all took out. Water full of methane, okay? Maybe due to geological regions, but today's methane concentration is extremely low because anaerobic life have this, one of the regions being, not, not the only region, one of the regions being, the anaerobic life has some substance reduced who are using methane, could be made methane. So methane concentration has substantially gone down uh, through the process of evolution. So we have very low carbon dioxide world, low CO2 world in, in context of geological past. We have high oxygen concentration world, okay, in, in relation to geological past and very low methane in the geological past. So if you see our geological past, we had lots and lots of different atmosphere. So climate of the world is changing every year, right from the origin of Earth, okay? It's not that climate is changing today, but climate changing every year, every day, every minute, okay? All right, next slide, please, okay. If you see that now the temperature, if you see this is the dotted line you can see, this dotted line is the uh, anything left to this dotted line is cooling phase, anything right to the dotted line is the warming phase. So if you again look at geo geological past, we are all warm climates except Carboniferous era. Okay, we had four ice ages, ice houses before, but a cooling phase. But one cooling phase in recent geological past was the Carboniferous era. Okay, you can see this is white here, means ice house, the cold conditions, low earth, earth. So Carboniferous era had a lot of productivity, a lot of photosynthesis, a lot of productivity, a lot of biodiversity also took place in the Carboniferous era. And C3 plants flourished in this area, evolved and flourished in the Carboniferous era, okay? And as we gone down, go down in history, you can see Triassic, Jurassic, and all is a warming phase, you can see. So all are warming phase. So our geological past is usually warm, usually hot, okay, but in Carboniferous era, we are cold climate. Then came all Cretaceous, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and now we are actually in the Quaternary. We are in the cooling phase. We are in ice house now. Okay, the geological past. If you see, we are in house, ice house. We are cooling phase. And what is it? One point. This cooling phase started only 1.75 million years ago. Okay, well, this is the ice house cooling phase of the world. And if you see the sea level, because the cooling phase, the sea level is the minimum today. Okay, to, to a comparability to a geological past. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, of course, IPPC says CO2 concentration is going to increase. It may reach at the end of century, it may reach 700 ppm, but it may not reach that much. It, but um, it may certainly reach 600 ppm by the end of the century, or 650 ppm by the end of the century. And temperature, it may rise by 3 degrees centigrade by end of the century. Why temperature increase, all of you know, but because of emission of greenhouse gases. All right? So, <clears throat> next slide, please. 
So we are going to high CO2 world again, going back to high CO2 world again, okay? Because of human interaction with nature. One is CO2 concentration went down due to geological reasons, many other reasons, when you are not there. After Homo sapiens evolved, you, you, around one to 1.5 million of years ago, then because of interaction with nature, okay, we cut down forests, okay, and we, you know, did a lot of, you know, destruction of the bi biodiversity we created, uh, you know, that's actually lead led to the increase of the temperature, increase of carbon dioxide concentration, because it's mostly due to the loss of the forests, okay? All right, CO2 concentration, because who conserve, who absorbs CO2 from atmosphere? The CO2, the plants, the trees, okay? And CO2, once you cut down the forests, your CO2 concentration is now again going to go up and up, okay? And it's not only that, the temperature of the earth also going, is going to increase, okay? One, of course, your, so of course the temperature is going up and up and up. Next slide. So, okay. So I, in this context, I want to talk about a plant called photosynthesis, but I told you process, the photosynthesis is a process, it's the only process on this earth, which only, which uh, gives a negative entropy, okay? Reduces the entropy of the world, desertedness of the world by stitching six free cis carbon dioxide molecules to one carbon carbohydrate molecule. So the randomness of system decreasing once you stitch these carbon dioxide molecules to a single molecule, okay? So therefore, the, this is the only process on Earth which is creating negative entropy. And another process is it is creating food security for us, providing food for us. And not only that, it's creating oxygen for us. Okay. You can see photosynthetic oxygen has increased. Okay. And can you go back to two slides back? Two slides back. Go back. Back. Yes. You see, <clears throat> they all along were C3 plants. Only 40 million of years ago, okay, you said drop in the CO2 concentration. Okay. 40 million of years ago. When around 40 million years ago, CO2 concentration decreased, okay? So plants became so low, okay? Plants were forced to evolve another kind of species called C4 plants, okay? Because CO2 concentration atmosphere was low, so they had to, you know, uh, compensate for the loss of uh, carbohydrates in the nature for themselves also, so therefore, they had to evolve C4 plants, okay? So see, so, and what happened again? When C4, next slide please. When C4 plants evolved around 40 million of years ago, what's the temperature? Temperature around 40 million of years ago, what well, you can see here is quite warm, okay? So C4 plants naturally evolved in low CO2 world and high temperature world. When C3 plants evolve mostly, they evolve in the, in the mostly carbon ferrous era, which were mostly cooling phase, okay. So C4 plants are adapted to high temperature because they simply evolve in high temperature world and also they evolve in low CO2 world, okay. Therefore they can, they can you know, photosynthesis better at low CO2, okay. Next slide. Next, next, yes. So this enzyme called Rubisco, ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, which fixes, you know, carbon dioxide. So ribulose bisphosphate plus carbon dioxide will give you two molecules of three phosphoglyceric acid. And these are converted back, converted later on to carbohydrates, okay? And, but the problem is, <clears throat> C3 plants when they evolve, or well, Rubisco evolved in anaerobic world. Rubisco evolved in anaerobic world, when? When there was no oxygen, the photosynthetic bacteria, okay? Even low, early cyanobacteria, 
okay, when they have no oxygen, okay. So therefore, nature evolved an en en enzyme called Rubisco, but they did not have an oxygenation function because there is no oxygen there in the atmosphere. So this Rubisco evolved in an anaerobic world when there is no oxygen. So it evolved like that for, for, for fine, no problem, it objected for, for millions of years, for billions of years, but when the plants themselves produce oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis, then oxygen concentration in the atmosphere increased and that competed with CO2, okay, to, to compensate to, you know, for the loss of photosynthesis. Therefore, oxygenation started when CO2 concentration increased, okay, and CO2, sorry, oxygen concentration increased and CO2 concentration decreased in the atmosphere, okay? So it is only happened around 50 million of years ago, okay? When CO2 concentration dropped very, 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 very low, okay? Therefore, you can see that this, this instead of forming two molecules of phosphoglyceric acid, is forming one phosphoglyceric acid and one phosphoglycolic acid, okay? And this phosphoglycolic acid goes to photorespiration and therefore it cannot be utilized in photosynthesis. And therefore there's a loss of carbohydrate fixed by the plants. Okay, now all of you know it, all the students know it, I'm here, I'm see it's your next slide. Okay, I'll not deal with, I don't have time for this, next slide. I'm saying how Rubisco evolved and all that. I skip this slide. Yeah. So if a Rubisco is a, if you say Rubisco is a very, very sluggy enzyme. So it is like a turtle. Okay. Apart to that, there's another enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Okay. Which is very, very fast. It's a very cargos. It can very learn very fast. Okay. All right. That is carbon anhydrase. You can see Rubisco very slow. It catalyzes the catalyst on three to 10 reaction seconds per second. Okay. But so carbonic anhydrase does 500,000 reactions per second. So carbonic anhydrase is a very high turnover number. Okay. So it can do the reaction very, very fast. Okay. What carbon carbon carbonic anhydrase does? See, water plus carbon dioxide becomes bicarbonate. That's what it does. Okay. But Rubisco does the other thing, fixes carbon dioxide, carbohydrate. So Rubisco and carbon, carbon can have not comparable, okay? What is comparable is C4 system, phosphine or pyruvate, carboxylates. But I just give an example, okay? All right. The C3, you can see 50% is Rubisco in a lip, lip protein, and C4 is a little less because you have another pep carboxylate in there. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I, I skip this slide, don't have to talk about it. Next slide. All of you know, this is the rice plant and the maize plant, C3 and C4 plant. Okay, so C3 plants, this is the for mesophyll bundle seed cells here, which is of course, do not have any chloroplasts. Okay, maybe rudimentary bundle seed, but here we have a lot of very well-developed bundle seeds having chloroplasts. Okay, so these are C4 plants. The question is why C4 plant? Next slide. Okay, why C4 plants? Because it is efficient in photosynthesis. Because it does not have photorespiration. Okay, so it has abolished photorespiration in the process of evolution. Okay, and uh, I will. I don't have to talk to details of this. I don't have time for it. Okay, all right. <clears throat> But there's one enzyme that I'm showing you this slide. The in plants are through millions of years evolution have evolved, evolved an enzyme for phosphoenol pyruvate carboxylates. This phosphoenol pyruvate carboxylates, have, you know, in, in addition to Rubisco, ribulose bisphosphate carboxyl oxygenase in chloroplast, there's another enzyme called phosphoenol pyruvate carboxylates. Phosphoenol pyruvate carboxylates is present in the mesophyll cells of the cytoplasm, okay? And mesophyll cell chloroplasts do not have Rubisco, okay? 
So plant I evolved for millions of years, millions of years, and then got phosphopyruvate carboxylate. So what is substrate, sir? Phosphonyl pyruvic acid and bicarbonate. The add is two substrate of phosphonyl pyruvate carboxylates. So phosphonyl pyruvate carboxylates plus carbon uh, uh, converts phosphonyl pyruvic acid, the three carbon compound plus a bicarbonate, which is a one carbon compound, to form a C4 compound called oxaloacetic acid. And oxaloacetic acid for the metabolized later on, and again released, increases CO2 concentration in the vicinity of Rubisco to abolish photorespiration in C4 plants. I'm not good details of that. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Next slide. Yeah, so what the advantage of C4 plant? As you said, this is the carbon dioxide concentration in, in the x-axis, rate of photosynthesis on the y-axis, okay? So you can see if we, <coughs> this is zero CO2 concentration, okay? And we're increasing CO2 concentration, okay? As the CO2 concentration increasing, of course, C3 plant in red, so C3 photosynthesis is going to increase, increasing and remaining constant later on, saturating. While C4 photosynthesis, look at C4 photosynthesis in yellow. At CO2, very, so because it evolved in low CO2 world, good C4 plants, evolved means low CO2 world. So they know to capture CO2 more efficiently, okay, by another enzyme called phosphonopyruvate carboxylase, which does not react with oxygen, okay. Therefore, you can see very fast, it's saturated very fast, okay? Very fast, okay? So, so today's concentration carbon dioxide is around 400 ppm. You can see C4 plants have already saturated, okay, in photosynthesis. Even if we increase the CO2 concentration, C4 plants are not going to increase their photosynthetic rate anymore. For C3 plants, photosynthesis rate is still going to go up and may saturate at the C4 level later on. Okay. So you can see, therefore, how efficiently C4 plants can photosynthesize even at this atmospheric CO2 concentration. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. One important thing of C4 plants, you must say is that temperature, okay? C4 plant is a morning to 12, 12 o'clock in the noon, full, full sun. You can see a C4 plants is doing much, 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 much better. Yeah, able to utilize the light intensity, okay? For C3 plants filling. Not only that, compare, this is a very interesting thing, okay? Always C4 plant is not advantageous over C3. In low temperature, C3 plants are much better than C4, okay? As you can see here, at 10 degrees centigrade, okay? Look at the C3 plant, sorry, C3 plant, okay. So C3 plant and C4 plant. This is C3, this is C4, okay? So the C4 plant, you can see at 10 degrees centigrade, is performing much less than the C3 plant, okay? For 35 degrees centigrade, C4 plants are performing much more than the C3 plant. So since C4 plants evolved in high CO2 world, low CO2 world, but high temperature world, 40 million of years ago, therefore they're naturally adapted to high temperature. Okay. So when you're talking about tribe and resilient agriculture, we should focus on C4 plants for further agriculture research, whether millets, or they or they are near the crop plant, C4 crop plant. That will be our future research, future food. Okay, because at 35 degrees centigrade, you can see the photosynthesis rate has already reduced in C3 plants. And once you once go to 38 or 40 degrees centigrade, we'll see sharp decline in the C3 photosynthesis. But C4 photosynthesis. If, in, if in you go to 38 degrees centigrade, nothing is going to happen. 
to the sea, or 40 degree, I mean 39 degrees centigrade, the thing going to happen to sea for cloth. Okay, so because they're naturally high temperature resilient. And not only that, they can also conserve a lot of water. Their water conservation capacity is very, very high. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, I stop. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, next. Okay, I will only in a very couple, one or two slides from here, a few slides from here. So what I have done over expressed an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Okay, as I told you, carbonic anhydrase is 20,000, much, much, much faster enzyme than Rubisco, of course. So carbonic anhydrase has overexpressed, but we took carbonic anhydrase from Fraveria bidentis. Fraveria bidentis is a C4 plant. It is very, very low KM for CO2. Low KM. Low KM means higher the affinity. C3 plant is around 10 times low KM means it is 10 times faster enzyme, okay, than the C3 uh, CA, carbon anhydrase. C3 plants are carbon anhydrase, anhydrase, C4 also carbon anhydrase. But C4 carbon anhydrase has very low KM, low KM for carbon dioxide means a very high affinity for carbon dioxide. Okay, next slide. Next slide, Deepika Kondo did the work. Okay, so, so there are many kinds of carbon anhydrase. We will not talk about that also in mitochondria, chloroplast, cytoplasm. Next slide. I will skip the slides. Next, next. Yeah, there are different kinds of carbon anhydrase present in chloroplast, cytosol, mitochondria, CA1, CA2, CA3, CA4, CA5. Next. Yeah, so it does clone in the gene or, or, or transgenic cells. Skip these slides, but next. Yeah, we clone a fiber of entities, a vector, go ahead. Yeah, these are transgenic plants, okay? So you can say vector control and wild type plants, and they are two transgenic plants, Arabidopsis. They are Arabidopsis thaliana, okay? And we saw that the plants are a little bigger than the wild type plants. And we explain a minute while. Next slide. Yeah, this is our transgenic, transgenic southern blood. Now the next, yeah, ne uh, yeah, relative expression of carbon anhydrases, the expression of gene expression increased. Next, protein expression also increased, and carbon anhydrase activity in the plants in transgenics increased. Different transgenic lines. Next slide. Next. Yeah. So what happened? Chlorophyll content increased, okay? And amino acids content increased and protein content also increased in the transgenics. So I wondered why amino acids and protein content increased. Next slide. Next slide, we will not talk about this. Yeah, also not only the photosynthesis not increased, but also dry water plan increased 3.6 to 4.1 and Starch content also increased. Okay, 1.8 to 0.1. Next slide. We are not saying massive increase. Okay, whatever is body increase, around 15 to uh, 13 to 15 percent. We have tried to explain that. Okay. Okay. Next slide. Yeah. So you can see here chlorophyll content. But uh, one important thing we must say: why it happened? Why protein content increased? You can see malic acid, fumaric acid increased. So what happened in phosphorin or pyruvate carboxylates, you also you present also in C3 plants. Not that only C4 plants present. PEP carboxyl also present in the C3 plants. Okay. So this C3 PEPC reacting with carbon dioxide to give you oxaloacetic acid in the cytoplasm. This oxaloacetic acid is migrating from the cytoplasm, okay, to the mitochondria, okay, to, and reaching in, uh, going to the Krebs cycle, okay, and producing malic acid there, so the Krebs cycle. Not only that, you can, therefore, you can see that malic acid increased, fumaric acid increased, and aspartic acid, aspartine, glutamic acid, glutamine, alanine, al 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 all different kinds of amino acids also increased, because of the acetic acid fed to the producing the cytoplasm, because of the 
bicarbonate concentration increasing in the increasing could produce some kind of amino acids. Okay. All right. Therefore, photosystem one, photosystem two activities also increase. Next slide. Yeah. Then photosystem two electron transport rate increase. Yeah. If photosystem efficiency increase. Next slide. Yeah. Next slide. You can. We'll go to the end of it. Yeah. What are photosynthesis, carbon assimilation, the wild type and transgenic plants? And, and next slide. And this is huge assimilation rate, different carbon side, carbon concentration, wild type transgenic plants. You can see how photosynthesis rate increase in transgenic plants. And not only that, we also did perform the experiment 2% oxygen, and we also saw the increase in the photosynthesis rate. From all these, we concluded that photosynthesis rate, carbonic anhydrase, it could be used. Next slide. Yeah, so this is our model, final model, that carbon dioxide. This is a better. This is what Fabra-Beria bidentis carbonic anhydrase we express in the cytoplasm. So CO2, the protein could increase. We produce a lot of bicarbonate increase. Therefore, the CO2 plus water become bicarbonate. This bicarbonate reactor with the phosphorylpyruvic uh, PP by the enzyme phosphorylpyruvic carboxylase to give oxaloacetic acid. Oxaloacetic acid concentration increase that could in migrate to mitochondria where they form malic acid and other organic acids increase. And the amino acids increase, then protein content increase because amino acid increase, and that in turn increase the entire photosynthetic process. Yeah, I will skip this slide. The plants are also tolerant under stress. Go, go back to the last slide. Go to the last end, end slide. Yeah. Conclusions. Overexpansion C4, 5 by bidentis. CA in order to increase amino acid content, protein content, protein efficiency, plant biomass, water efficiency, and comfort tolerance to cell under stress. Like C4 plants, transgenics are tolerant to salt stress. This single cell C4 up, the single cell C4 approach. Could we replicate in crop plants, of course, to give you better foreign product? Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor. 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 Thank you, Elevated carbon dioxide? Yes. So you're saying elevated carbon dioxide, increasing? Paper simply plants huh. for increased photosynthetic efficiency, huh. as well as, sir, uh, for utilizing ammonia as a nitrogen source. Okay. So, and you told sir also that uh, when carbon dioxide concentration went down, then C3 plants, they evolved to C4 plants. Yes. Okay, sir. Yes. Then, sir, why do we need to change a C3 plant to C4? That's it. Because, because, you see, there is one enzyme called Ruby Square 2. So, oxygen and CO2 are competing for the same active site. So, for the year, millions of years of evolution, plant didn't or couldn't change the active side of the beast. Okay, in favor of carboxylation, over oxygen. Okay, so therefore, plants were forced to concentrate carbon dioxide in the vicinity of the beast. Okay, so they found another set of plants called C4 plants, which could fix carbon dioxide. Okay, efficiently in cytoplasm, not in chloroplast, cytoplasm, transfer that carbon dioxide to the bundle cells where the rubisco is. Therefore, CO2 concentration increase will be similar to rubisco. So, therefore, CO2 outcompeted oxygen. Okay, CO4 plant became more productive because CO2, CO2 oxygen outcompeted in C4. Like carbon concentration, CCM. 
the carbon content can be increased in the system. Therefore, the plants could not change their activity useful. So therefore, they evolved other seed for plants, which uh, even though uh, CO2, it can potential for the respire, but CO2 is increasing in the vicinity. So it is mimicking the high CO2 water, okay, which are there million, millions of years. So in that case, they can they use the I mean that is the uh, C1 fat. See? C1 that is summer macrophytes. Summer macrophytes, yeah. Summer macrophytes, you know. What do you want to say? There is carbonic anhydrase from one summer macrophyte plants to rice. Yeah, we can talk about it, but we don't have time for it. Okay? We can talk about it later, huh? We don't have time for it. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to just share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? I cannot hear. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, I cannot hear you. Uh, yes, Professor Cole. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. You yeah, can hear you. So if you can hear me, maybe I can I proceed? Uh, maybe can you send me? I, okay, let me check the chat box here. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, okay. I'm not sure why I am not hearing you. Uh, okay, uh, as you have confirmed that you can hear me, let me proceed. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank the organizers for giving me this uh, opportunity to, to talk about the potential of genome editing for uh, sustainable um, agriculture. Uh, as you know that, you know, there is a major uh, global challenge in agriculture is the food security right now. Uh, because uh, the population is increasing very fast and the world population is going to is projected to be uh, 9.8 uh, billion uh, by 2050 so in order to feed those many people uh, we need uh, to grow our uh, agriculture production to be doubled um, but on the same resources because that's not going to change uh, uh, you know because like you know we have limited land and the and water and and even the other resources um, so our challenge remains to actually um, and, and on top of that there is a climate change which is intensifying this uh, this challenge as we already started seeing the harmful influence um, uh, of the climate change not only on the plants itself but also on the pathogen and pest affecting the the crop productivity uh, so what we need, we need sustainable, um, in order to have a sustainable agriculture, we really need to actually uh, close the yield gap uh, among all the different crops, whether this is like a wheat, maize, rice, or, or bananas, you know, which are mainly the staple food crop in, in, in Africa. And in order to do so, uh, we need to um, actually tap on the full potential of all the tools available in our toolbox, um, including the new breeding tools such as uh, uh, gene editing. Uh, I'm not trying to say that, you know, gene editing is like a sil silver bullet which can solve all the problem. But what I'm trying to say that we need to use all the tools, including the conventional technologies and complementing them with the new breeding, new breeding tools. So gene editing is actually um, is a quite powerful tool, uh, and it is uh, actually a group of techniques, not one, because gene editing includes meganucleases, zinc finger nucleases, talents, and more recently the CRISPR Cas. And this this technique is used to making like a more precise and efficient specific changes uh, to the DNA. So what happens in this technology that these these nucleases make a double cut um, in the DNA strand, and then after that, the DNA the the repair machine machinery of the cell itself actually repairs um, uh, those those uh, um, double stranded break, and the repair can happen either as a non homologous and joining, and because this type of repair is error prone, it can create some mutations. But then these mutations are actually targeted. The second way of repair is based on the homology directed repair where the donor template is present. And in that case, there is normally the insertion. It can be used for the allele replacement or the, or, or the insertion. So genome editing can be used to add, remove, or even alter the DNA in the, in the genome. Okay, so genome editing is not new. Nature has been editing the genome for a very long time. And then what will happen in the past, like, you know, when the uh, mutations happened in the nature and then the farmers were selecting the varieties, that's how the, all the domestication happened. But in 20th century, uh, the mutations were accelerated through chemicals and the radiation. Like in 1895, there was radiation discovery. In 1927, there was first plant reported using the radiation uh, mutation. And then in 1944, the chemical-based mutations were reported. Later on, the technologies were developed for more precise 
gene targeting mutation because uh, with the chemical and the radiation, the mutations were random. And, and so that's the time the zinc finger nucleases, mega nucleases, and the talents uh, were reported. But more later, like in 2013, the CRISPR uh, technology was uh, was discovered. And finally, this technology has become the most popular genome editing approach. And CRISPR-Cas9 technology actually won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020. But the, it has is still not, not like, you know, we will not say that's the final because this technology is really very fast evolving. If you will see every other week, you see something new coming up on this one. So now there is base editing, prime editing, and as well as the CRISPR activation. So new tools in the toolbox. Um, this technology, um, CRISPR-Cas, has become like now the most popular technology for functional genomics as well as for crop improvement. And then there are more than 40 different uh, plant species where this, this uh, technology has been applied. You can apply the CRISPR-Cas system um, either for creating the mutations like deletions, insertions, replacement, um, uh, which is through the non-homologous end joining or e even for the homologous directed. So in this case, is this technology is based on the double-stranded cut. But later on, this also the CRISPR has been modified where the Cas9 is, is deactivated or we call it dead Cas9. And in that case, it doesn't create the double-stranded uh, break. And then this technology actually can be used to upregulate your gene, like a gene activation or inhibition of the gene, which is gene repressor. Um, this, this, uh, another technology which has been also been later um, uh, reported is actually using the Nikase Cas9. In, in that case that, you know, there is a break only in the one strand, not in the both the strands. And this is used for the base editing and the prime editing. So based on different type of um, editing, actually it's very important to understand what type of um, addicts you are getting. Uh, so when there is a, as I explained, when there is a double-stranded break, uh, the repair can happen two different ways. One is the non-homologous end joining. And in that case, uh, you get the targeted, but the random mutations. And most of the time, these are small indels. It can be small in, um, uh, insertion or deletion, and we call them SDN1. So um, SDN, because these nucleases are the side-directed nucleases, that's SDN, and so this is type one, so it's called SDN1. Okay, uh, and this is mainly used for the gene silencing or the gene knockout. The second way is when, when you provide the donor template. And in that case, you know, either it can be small um, insertion or like a copy of the repair. And this is SDN2. And then it can also be the full insertion of the gene. So this is used for the gene insertion or the allele replacement. And, and in this case, you know, the donor DNA is copied. So what happens is like in SDN1 is very similar to the mutations which are you which somebody can obtain even naturally or using the chemical mutagenesis or irradiation, but they are targeted. So SDN1 type of mutations are not regulated as GMOs in in uh, uh, several countries, but SDN3 type of mutation it depends upon what is the donor DNA. If the donor DNA is from the same plant species, like, like for example, uh, if I am editing banana and if the donor DNA is from the wild type banana or another variety of banana species, in that case, this is also not regulated as GMO. But if the donor template is a foreign DNA from the different plant species, then these edited products are treated as GMOs. So quickly give you an idea what's happening globally uh, with the legislation for the genome edited products. So you see in this map, the countries which are shaded in green, these are the countries where the uh, guidelines are available for the genome editing. And based on those guidelines, actually genome edited crops, um, if there is no foreign gene integration in them, they are not regulated as GMO. The countries, uh, which are shaded in yellow, these are the countries actually where the discussion is ongoing. 
And then the countries which are shaded in red, these are the countries where actually the genome edited products and the GMOs are treated similar, like in Europe, South Africa, and New Zealand. Uh, so India is actually um, among those countries where the gene edited crops with no foreign gene integration are not regulated as GMO. And, and if we come to Africa, actually there are several countries like Kenya, Nigeria, uh, Malawi, recently Ethiopia and Ghana. These are the countries who have the, approved the guidelines in the similar uh, fashion. So if, you, if I give you a little bit more clearer, so like, you know, so you see they, there are the conventional, that means the, the new varieties developed using the traditional breeding. They are not regulated as GMO. They are, you know, there is no product which are not regulated, but then there are different ways of regulation because if a new variety is developed, each country has their some way of regulating it um, be before it gets registered and then commercialize uh, uh, those varieties. Uh, so, but if they are not regulated as GMOs, okay? Uh, when it comes to the genetically modified, those are, they are, there is a biosafety regulation there. But when you come, it comes to the gene editing, SDN1 type are actually not, not regulated as GMO in several countries. SDN1, it depends. Some of the countries, SDN1 is also not regulated, but some of the countries, they said, as they only uh, consider SDN1 as not GMO, but SDN2 are part of that one. But SDN3 are actually regulated if there is the, the integration of the gene is actually the foreign gene. So, so basically it depends when there's a DNA integration, whether they, that is native or foreign, depending on that, it is, it is regulated. Uh, gene adding, editing, the potentials are real. We started already seeing a lot of, lot of potential. And so this technology can be um, uh, used for either for the functional genomics, that is the gene discovery, or you can use it for enhancement of the nutrition in uh, yield improvement, um, making the uh, variety uh, crops resistance to the biotic stresses like bacterial disease, viral fung fungi, or, or, or the abiotic stresses like drought, salt, heat, cold. Um, and there are also groups working on the herbicide tolerance. There is one very interesting note on this one is like in comparison to the uh, GM, which were more in the in the big private sector's um, hand. Now this gene editing is actually more under the public sector, as you can see um, uh, here. Um, and and then there are uh, a public sector or the small startup companies. So that's a that's a big difference between the two. And this technology has been applied to more than forty different crop species in more than twenty five countries and addressing these traits, which I have explained here. Um, there are some examples we can show, like, for example, there is a high oleic uh, soybean oil, which is the first uh, gene edited product um, uh, commercialized. This is already in, on the, in the market in US. And actually, this soybean ha has been developed using talents. There is a Japan has approved its first gene edited tomato, and these are the CRISPR tomatoes, which has which are rich in GABA, the gamma amino butyric acid, and it can fight actually the high blood pressure. There are also this uh, non-browning mushroom, which has been approved uh, in U.S. and Canada as non-GM. And then there is rice, this bacteria blight rice, which is actually not on the market yet, but then USDA and the Colombian regulators have approved them as, um, as non-GM. Um, recently, uh, uh, there are drought tolerant soybean, which has already been also been approved in Argentina, Brazil, and, and Colombia as non-GM. And then in few months back, actually, there are maize, which are tolerant to maize lethal necrosis disease, has been approved as non-GM in Kenya. So I will give you a few examples from banana, what we are, what we are working on. Uh, why banana? Actually, banana is a major staple food crop um, uh, grown in more than 136 countries. And out of this um, uh, 
one third of that banana actually is grown in Africa. India is the number one production of banana, but in India, the banana is used more as a fruit crop. But when you come to Africa, this is actually a staple food. It's similar to the rice and wheat in India and or the like mashed potatoes in in. Uh, in Europe, that's how in Africa they are eat. So, you know, you see, this is their meal. So this is all banana eat by like, you know, this is like a beans, which uh, which they go. And this is another another way they eat is called matoke. This is very common in Uganda. And some of the countries in, in Africa, like Uganda, Rwanda, these are the countries which are not only the major producer of banana, but they are also major consumption of banana. They can consume up to like, you know, 0.7 kilogram daily per person, which is equivalent to 191 kilogram per year. So you can imagine how important the banana crop is. But still, there is a big problem with the yield of this crop. The potential of the banana in the cooking variety of banana is 70 ton per hectare uh, per year, but the actual is actually 5 to 30 ton per hectare. So you can see the huge gap here. The same way of the another type of banana called plantain. So the, it also is a huge gap. And this is basically because of the lot of diseases and pests. There are fungal diseases affecting banana like black cigatoka, fusarium will. There are um, bacterial diseases. There are also viruses like banana bunchy top, banana streak. And then there are uh, uh, insects, pests like nematodes and weevil. The problem is not only that there are so many pests and pathogens, but the challenge is that you, know, you will find more than one pest or pathogen actually affecting the banana crop in the same field. So that's the biggest challenge for the farmer. So there is a critical need to develop the improved banana varieties with a broad back spectrum resistance to where, where, uh, with various diseases and pests. So at IITA, we have a very strong crop improvement program for banana. And our focus is disease resistance. And here we apply all the different tools available to us. Starting from the selection uh, in, in the available uh, germplasm uh, for the resistant varieties. We also have a very big conventional breeding program for banana. Many people think that, you know, you cannot do the breeding in banana, but that's not true. Um, then we also apply the biotechnological tools like, like you know, uh, transgenic approaches for the, like using genetic modification or the gene editing. And for gene editing, we are working on several traits like banana streak virus, banana xanthomonas wilt, fusarium wilt, and black cigatoga. But for today, keeping time in mind, I think I will just give you example of two different traits where we have more advancement. So we have uh, established the CRISPR-Cas9 based uh, gene editing um, for, for both banana and plantain. Let me explain here. You know, banana is triploid. Most of the cultivated bananas are triploid actually. Uh, the, uh, for the breeding, we use the uh, diploids, which are the banana progenitor. So when in the triploid, actually they, they have two different types of genome, A genome and the B genome. And uh, so the most of the dessert type of bananas, like which we use uh, as fruits, those are the triple A's. The cooking varieties are mainly the uh, AAB or ABBs, and the plantains are AAB. So we established the genome editing uh, system for all different uh, uh, groups of, of bananas with uh, different uh, um, uh, genomic groups, okay? And so we use like PDS, which is a phytoene desaturase, which is involved in the beta carotene pathway and as a visual marker. So PDS, if the PDS, uh, that is phytoene desaturase, if the PDS is functional, plants are green. Okay, if we knock out the PDS, then we make the albino plants. So it also depends because there are three alleles. If you knock out all the three alleles, then you get this type of complete albino plants. If few alleles has been knocked out and, and some remain, then we get these type of chimeric plants. And this is the wild type where we have not knocked out the, the PDS. And then we have actually, after that, we have done the target sequencing and this, based on this sequencing, we we identified uh, the targeted uh, mutations. So once we established the system, we applied that system uh, for 
making the bananas resistant to one of this virus called banana streak virus. So banana streak virus is a double-stranded DNA badna virus. And this virus ha uh, has a problem that it integrates into the B genome of the of banana. So this is a problem only in the banana varieties, which has B genome. So banana streak virus is 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 a it has a monopartite genome, and and basically it has three open reading frames. Open reading frame one and two. These are small open reading frames, and they are mainly involved in the virion assembly. Okay, open reading frame three, which you see here in red, this is a big open reading frame. And basically it is a polyprotein, which cleaves later on at the aspartic protease to make this all the functional protein. And this is the open reading frame where all the essential genes are there. Like for example, the movement protein, the code protein, aspartic protease, reverse transcriptase and RNAs H. So this virus, when it integrates in, in the B genome of the banana, it, it first of all, it integrates as a specific locus in the chromosome one. And then it always integrates in a multiple copies as a direct and the indirect tandem repeats. When it is integrated, the banana, uh, they actually, it sits very quietly. It has become like an endogenous part of the banana genome and banana doesn't show any symptom when it is integrated. But what happens when the plant are stressed and these stressed can be the environmental stress like increase in temperature or drought or the stress can be the hybridization during the crossing or the tissue culture. You know, this is a vegetatively propagated crop. So, so you know, you, you use tissue culture to multiplication. That's time when the, so plant treat that as a stress as well. And during the stress, this integrated um, virus becomes activated as in the episomal form. And then the plant is start showing the symptoms like you, this yellow streak. And then if it affects the yield. So because of this activation, and then at some phase not showing symptom, another phase showing symptom, it has become a very challenging for the breeders uh, in, the, uh, for, in the breeding program, but also in the dissemination of the hybrids. Many uh, uh, regulators in several countries actually doesn't allow the movement of these plantain, particularly plantain hybrids from one country to another because of this challenge of the virus. And then another thing is that, you know, Musa Balbisiana, which is a progenitor, uh, it has BB genome. This is a very good parent because it has um, resistance to most of the diseases, but breeders cannot use this one into their breeding program because of the issue of this banana streak virus there. So, so that's why when we have established the genome editing, we felt like, okay, let's let's target this one so the approach i am using here is like you know we are trying to knock out this viral sequences so that it doesn't activates into the uh, uh, um, in, in, into the virulent uh, uh, viral uh, the infectious viral particles so the approach i am using it i'm like you know knocking out all the three open reading frame and so we have designed the guide RNA from open reading frame one, two, and in open reading frame three, actually I picked aspartic protease because my intention was that if I can knock out aspartic protease, which is required to make this polyprotein into the functional proteins, then I can actually make all the proteins non-functional because there will be no cleavage at the aspartic protease to make the functional protein. So we worked with a, with a variety called Gonja Manjaya, which is a plantain very commonly grown in, in, in East and Central Africa. And then first what we did was we have to characterize this plant to see that what is the integration pattern of this virus. So we found, we, got, we did a lot of molecular characterization to see this type of in a integration pattern, which actually what we are thinking. And then, then we designed the three guide RNA, we multiplex the guide RNA, and we delivered the guide RNA and the CAS, which we call now CRISPR-Cas reagents, into the cell suspension of banana. So these are like uh, you know single cells of banana in the liquid form, and then each cell has the potential to grow into the complete plant legs. So we have delivered these CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, reagents into this, and then regenerated 
the plantlets. After that, we did quite a lot of molecular characterization to find out, uh, to detect the mutation. So we did the, later on, we did the sequencing. Uh, we didn't do the full genome sequence. What we did was the target sequencing. From the targets, uh, we uh, were, uh, we were uh, expecting the mutation. So our first target was like a uh, open reading frame one, and the second is the open reading frame two. Because these targets were very close, I was expecting a deletion of 198 base pair of the viral genome from there. And that's what actually what I was expecting. Actually, I saw the same thing in our mutants. And in the open reading frame three, because there was only one guide RNA design there, so we were expecting small indels, and that's what we saw. So after that, we actually um, uh, selected the mutants, and then you know uh, we have done a glass house uh, uh, um, evaluation. And here we mimicked the drought. So, you know, we didn't water these plants. And so because drought is a stress. So this is our, our wild type, which actually really showed the uh, very nice yellow streaks, like the symptom of the, of the virus. But then several of the mutants actually didn't show any symptom after the, after the stress. And we have further um, confirmed that uh, as like virus load. And we didn't see any virus in these in these mutants. But the two mutants actually uh, showed some mild uh, uh, symptoms. So I was very curious to know what happened to these mutants, why they were showing the mild symptoms. So after characterization, we noticed that the, the these three mutants, uh, which had the asymptom um, asymptomatic mutants, which had no symptoms at all, actually they have the mutation in all the three open reading frames. Uh, whereas in these two, there was symptom, uh, there was a, a mutation only in open reading frame one and two, but not in the open reading frame three. But you remember I mentioned that open reading frame three plays a, 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 a crucial role because that's where all the functional genes are there. Um, so that was, so we have now the proof of concept that, you know, if we can create the mutation in the as aspartic, uh, we make the non-functional aspartic protease, then actually we can disrupt the function of protease and we can, uh, we can inactivate uh, the virus. So this is now uh, we have, we are working uh, with further with this, uh, all the plantains to take them to the field to confirm our, our theory there. The second story is from the banana xanthomonas will. This is a very serious uh, problem because it is devastating banana plantation in the Great Lakes region of the East Africa, which is also the major banana producing area. The, the losses can be 40 to 80 percent in total in, in depending upon the country. Uh, but when you go to the field, actually is an absolute loss because once the disease is there, it is spreads very fast and it wipe off the whole field of banana plantation within few months time. Um, and so, and all the cultivated varieties are actually susceptible to this disease. There is only wild type banana, Musa balbisiana, which has found to be the resistance. There are few other wild type bananas which are tolerant to this disease. Um, so, and the overall economic losses are estimated to be two to eight billion over a decade, which is a big amount of uh, loss for, for African countries. And as I mentioned, all the banana varieties are susceptible. And basically this type, you see this type of scenario because once the, the field is infected with, uh, with this disease, there is no other option than to actually uproot the plants and leave the field fallow for a minimum of six months before it can be replanted by another uh, bananas. So what we did was we have actually studied the Musa balbisiana at the molecular level to understand what makes this wild type banana as resistant to this disease. Um, so we, uh, we did the comparative uh, transcriptomic um, by infecting these uh, Musa balbisiana uh, with the bacterial pathogen and, and compared that uh, with the susceptible variety. 
And we did that at the early stages. And based on this comparative transcriptomics, actually we have identified a lot of targets which we can use it in our gene editing uh, program. Uh, some of them are the susceptibility genes, which are actually involved uh, in the development of the disease. Some of them are the transporter genes or the transcription factor involved as the negative regulator of, in the defense pathway. And right now we are testing about 10 different susceptibility genes by knocking out um, one by one and test. So what we are trying to do right now is like, this is the wild type. We have the full information, what is making these plants resistant and these are our susceptible cultivated varieties so we are transferring the information not the dna or anything just the information from this one to here based on the gene editing so either we are over expressing the defense genes which are the endogenous genes but we are up regulating them using crispr activation or we are knocking down the susceptibility gene using the crispr a Cas9 um, system. So one example I will show, which is the DMR6. You know, DMR6 is a downy mildew resistance 6, is a susceptibility gene, is a very well characterized susceptibility gene in Arabidopsis and rice. And this susceptibility gene is actually activated during the host pathogen interaction. So it normally overexpressed during the pathogen in infection and then suppress the plant immunity. So what we did was we find out the ortholog of this DMR6 in banana. Um, and we, we actually created the phylogenic uh, tree um, using like the uh, mapping it uh, with the uh, Arabidopsis, with the different Musa ecuminata, Balbiciana, uh, the Nicotiana, and as well as, as tomato. Uh, so if you want to know more detail about this, it is published in, in Plant Biotech Journal. Uh, uh, so you can also see. So we, based on this uh, um, uh, phylogeny, actually, we picked um, an ortholog. So we found seven different orthologs of DMR6, and we picked one specific ortholog uh, and then tested it by QRT-PCR. And then we saw that, yes, our susceptible variety, when the when it is infected by pathogen, actually this gene goes up by 60 fold, whereas this uh, Musa balbiciana, which, which we were using as control, actually has no differential expression. So this has given us the confidence that, you know, if we knock out this Musa DMR6 ortholog, then maybe we can make the plant resistant to the disease. So that's what we did. We designed the two guides uh, targeting the DMR6 ortholog, and we created the DMR6 mutants. Uh, we did the sequencing to, to detect the targeted mutations. And, and uh, so after that, we tested these plants using a rapid bioassay uh, with the, in, the, in the tissue culture. So these are our control wild type plants where you can see they have uh, completely wilted after challenging them with the bacterial pathogen. And these are our mutants, which were showing the resistance. So after further, what we did, we, we planted these ones in the greenhouse and challenged them um, with the bacterial by, in, uh, by like, you know, artificially um, in, in, uh, infecting them with the bacterial pathogen in the leaf petiole. And these are our control wild type and they completely wilted. They started showing symptoms in 10 days post inoculation. And within one month time, they were completely wilted. But these plants, we actually um, uh, grow them up to 90 days and they didn't show any symptom um, at all. Um, so we also wanted to see that whether knocking out this DMR6 will have no negative impact on plant growth because you know most of the genes they are not only involved for with one function they are involved with several functions as well so but it, under greenhouse condition actually we didn't see any detrimental effect of knocking out this uh, dmr6 and the main reason about that is because you remember i said that there are seven orthologs but intentionally we didn't knock out all the seven i only knocked out one so, so that you know, it doesn't have impact on the plant growth. So now we are ready to test them under the field condition um, to check like further the stability of the trait and the, and 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 also um, the effect on the yield um, and uh, 
so one thing which I would also like to say is that the mut mutations created through the CRISPR-Cas are actually quite stable, which we have already tested. We have multiplied these, our mutants for the seven different generation and then tested, and we find them, they have the same mutations uh, even after seven, seven generations. So this is my, my last slide where I would like to mention that, you know, um, because this is a very new technology, um, so in order that farmers to adopt the, uh, uh, like uh, the, uh, not only farmers, but the consumers to also start, uh, farmers to grow and consumers to start eating these type of varieties, you need to do quite a lot of public awareness and also need to create the capacity. So we are uh, very heavily involved in that one. We do a lot every year, one or two workshops where we invite the regulators, the journalists, the public, um, uh, like a farmer association representatives, um, uh, and, and we provide them more information on this technology. We are also building critical mass in Africa. So, you know, we are uh, training uh, a lot of students and the young researchers in our lab. And then recently, actually, we started um, a program, which is an African um, um, uh, uh, plant uh, breeding association where actually we uh, we are collaborating with UC Davis and UC Berkeley and you know that UC Berkeley this is the origin of the CRISPR uh, CRISPR technology because that's where the uh, Jennifer Doudna is based and then we are right now our this is a five years program and every year we are training 20 uh, young researchers um, these are scientists, they have PhDs already, and they are working with the national system in African institution, and we will be training five, five uh, scientists, uh, sorry, 20 scientists for five years, so in, in total we will be training um, 100 scientists in our lab there. And so the first batch of the scientists are actually under training currently in my lab, uh, started uh, from the 23rd of, of January. Um, so, so the key take home messages are uh, banana production is really constrained by several diseases and pests. Uh, CRISPR-Cas technology has rapidly become the most popular genome engineering approach because it is very simple, is efficient, is easy to adapt, and is very specific, um, um, and, and you can do multiplexing. So right now, we were multiplexing the different guide RNAs for one trait, but but our intention is that we will multiplex is to the different pathogens as well. Um, and, and so, you know, in banana, there is a need to develop the varieties with the multiple and the durable resistance to combat uh, the several biotic stresses. And that's where the CRISPR plays a major, major role. We have already demonstrated that the CRISPR-Cas based genome editing, we can inactivate the banana streak virus from the, uh, from the from the genome which was integrated there. We have also demonstrated that the DMR6 mutants of banana showed enhanced resistance to uh, uh, banana xanthomonas uh, wilt. And genome edited crops, uh, we are expecting our bananas as well with no foreign gene integration are not regulated as GMO in several countries. So in the end, I would like to acknowledge my team my plant transformation team, the bioinformatics team, and also the partners from UC Davis and the Alliance for, for Science, and the financial support from USAID and the CGIR uh, research program. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, I will be more than happy to take any question um, if my phone microphone works well. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention.
Uh, I cannot hear you, but but if you can write, if there is any question, please write in the chat box and then I can respond.
And one thing which I would like to add to the students or those who would like to work on, you know, like two things are very important if you want to work on genome editing. One is that there should not be even novel combination of genetic elements from different organisms as it happens in case of GM plants. As, and as a result of that, only the GM plants are regulated. Has anybody thought of it that why do we regulate after all GM plants? Because there is a novel recombination of genetic elements taking place from different organisms, which otherwise may not be possible for, for millions of years to occur in nature. But since we're doing it, so therefore, but here in case of SDN1 and SDN2, there's no such novel combination of genetic elements taking place that we are not taking organisms, different you know, genetic elements from different organisms. We are not making a recombinant DNA in the final product I'm talking about it. And then we are not therefore you know, calling it a GMO. And therefore in many of the countries, as you know, Dr. Lina Tripathi mentioned, these SDN1, SDN2 categories are considered as non-GMOs. And the second thing is that this is very important for the students if they may like to think about later working, you know, that why do we, have no regulation in case of SDN1 and SDN2 in genome edited plants. You know, the question was asked by one of the participants here from Dr. Kole, you know, whether we should worry about antibiotic resistance marker gene, and whether it is automatically after certain selfing, it is, you know, kind of, um, um, you know, removed, you know, with, from the, within the plant. We do use actually speaking antibiotic marker genes, which, which are required as we normally do in case of developing transgenic plants. You know, the first half as shown here is, we do develop a transgenic plant initially, you know, when we do genome editing. But later when you self it, that whole reagents, you know, used for like antibiotic marker gene or all the CRISPR reagents, they are, are removed. In fact, they are segregated out after do, do selfing. And that's what is shown here. So you can see here, the genome edited plant with transgens is a transgenic plant. It's a transgenic plant. When you self it, the, the, all those antibiotic marker genes or all the CRISPR reagents, then they are, you know, they are segregated out when you do the selfing. And therefore you select only the plant as shown here in red, the genome edited plants without any transgene. So it has only the edited portion, as I said before, SDN1 like, or SDN2, I'm talking about it here. And this is what is shown here in this particular slide. And this is the advantage of genome editing. And as a result of that, you can see here, you know, this has a great relevance. Actually speaking, when you talk of, you know, use of genome editing for climate change, if you want to enhance water use, conserv water conservation in rice, it has been demonstrated. Engineering microbes to curtail dependence on synthetic fertilizers. I mentioned before, that's one of the opportunities. Yes, it's been done. And also, can we have crops fixing more CO2 more efficiently? And this is what actually Jennifer Dodna, one of the, you know, person, scientist, lady scientist who shared the Nobel Prize, you know, in chemistry in 2022, she also feels, you know, that it has a big potential for, for use in, in, in climate change adaptation. And then in India, actually speaking, there's a lot of work going on already in about 25, 26 crops, the genome editing work is going on in India. And here, this is our honorable prime minister making a statement in the parliament saying that, yes, the farmers should get the first drought resistant and genome edited rice variety by 2026. And this is being developed, actually speaking, by Indian Agricultural Research Institute, you know, by Dr. Vishwanathan's group. Um, and and uh, this is, you know, showing an advantage of increased water use efficiency by, by at least 25% and saving, therefore, a lot of water. And not only that we try to increase the use efficiency of water, there is also a possibility we can try to, you know, increase the efficiency of nitrogen or fertilizers or potash utilization. And on the right panel, you can see here, as Dr. Robert Henry also mentioned, we can convert many of those wild species into cultivated rice, which will only take about two to four years instead of thousands of years, which, you know, normally domestication will take place, you know, that much in time here, we can try to do it in two to four years. And when you talk of information available or the genetic material available, we are very rich in India. We are the second largest gene bank in the whole world. We have compiled the whole information of wild relatives with all the characteristics given here, you know, of the cultivated plants in, in India. And, and germplasm to genome engineering is the final message, which I think is very important because natural genetic variation, which is existing in the germplasm, we can now try to mimic it through genome editing into our you know, new high yielding genotypes. And this is what actually the message I'm trying to give here through this particular slide. But finally, we are so very happy again 
you know, that India has exempted SDN1 and SDN2 category of plants, you know, from biosafety assessment. You don't have to go through biosafety assessment. If I may ask now any one of the students why we don't have to go through the biosafety assessment of SDN1 and SDN2. And therefore, India has exempted these plants from, from this regulation, which is otherwise applicable to GMO. Simply because, you know, there's no novel genetic combination taking place here. And in the final product, there's no such foreign or marker gene or nothing there, except the native sequences within the particular crop species have been edited or deleted or, or corrected the gene function. So this is what actually I'm showing you here, all the details, you know, that government of India has permitted, you know, excuse me, next slide, please. And now, so this is the slide I'm showing here in case of GM crops, the route was from IBSC to RCGM to GAC. This was the route. GAC is the final authority to approve the GM crops commercialization as they have done recently. I give you an example of GM mustard. But in case of genome editing, you know, IBSC to play a key role, only IBSC. RCGM and GAC are not coming to the picture to take a final decision when we talk of release of these genome editing plants in India. And this is exemption under rule 20 of the rules 1989, and therefore there is no need. And, and finally important is therefore, once we have got this kind of ad advantage as Dr. Lina Tripathi also mentioned Indian on the world map, India is green. You know, once we have that advantage, then what are the crops and the traits for which we should be working on in India? And these are the traits in a discussion with several of government of India scientists and, and even secretary level. This was the discussion and we identified these are the crops. I know there's a lot of work going on rice. There's a lot of work going on other crops. But important is what for India? Mustard, soybean, groundnut as oilseed crops, pulsey, chickpea, pigeon pea, and green gram. And of course, also we cannot forget rice, wheat, some of the you know, cash crops and even horticultural crops, which are very important. But finally, for the sake of the researchers in our country, we have come up with a roadmap, actually speaking in this kind of an article in current science, you know, with, what is that kind of, what are those crops and which are those priority traits and what are those genes and whether SDN1 and SDN2, whether genome editing in the exon region or genome editing in the promoter region, where it has to do what is all given here in this particular slide in, in article. I'll be happy to share with you all that article. So this was all in brief and I thank you friends very much. And again, thank organizers for giving this opportunity. Thank you. If there are any questions, if I have time, I believe, yes, I think I finished on time. And if there are questions, students, yes, please. Not really, not at all. No, functional genomics, true functional genomics. So while even those markers, even those markers and QTLs which have been identified, which are being used by the molecular beaters, you're right, which is going on. But if you do fine mapping of those genes and finally you come down to the level of a particular gene, you validate its function, function then you know, using transgenic approach in a model system. And then once you identify a particular gene, and, and a particular genetic element within a gene, it's a possible, then of course you can apply even genome editing. But otherwise, the important is in our country, we should give an equal emphasis on even identifying a particular genomic region or the gene, you know, which is important and associated with a particular trait before we do genome editing. Like many of these disease resistance genes, they've already been identified. You know, like Dr. Vishnathan, I give an example of uh, rice. He has identified one particular gene, which is a neg negative regulator you know, of drought tolerance. So if you, if you, um, you know, knock out its function, the plants become resistant. So that way, yes, it is important to identify genes. And therefore after genomics, that's what I was talking to my friend, Dr. Bashnath Tripathi sitting right here, that functional genomic is something we students should really come forward and using the genetic material, which is available with us genetic diversity in our gene banks that should be utilized to as extent as possible. My pleasure. Yes, please. Yes, after him. Yes, please. So you have committee in the committee, health ministry or health department for release of mustard genome. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. You know, actually, you know what? There is a system. There, there. I said before, there is an Environmental Protection Act, Government of India, 1986. Under that act, we have got rules. We call them as rules, 1989, right? Yeah. And those rules, under those rules, we have guidelines. Yeah. Under those guidelines, we have got standard operating procedures. And also under that act, there are three different committees, Institute of Biosafety Committee, Review Committee on Genetic Manipulation, Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee. And all these committees have experts from diverse fields which you're talking about. Right. Yeah, all those tests are done. For example, composition analysis were done by National Institute of Nutrition. Nutrition. Yes, in Hyderabad. Hyderabad. Yes. Yeah. Oh, nutrition. I'm asking for the higher technology. See, there's. You don't have to have a. You, you, you know, kind it's of. Also the National Institute and. Uh, wherever there is a requirement, only that National Institute will come into picture. If there's no requirement, why should it come into picture? If something is required for a particular crop, for a particular trade, involvement of that particular institute, yes, it is very much important. We should have it. Otherwise, why? Otherwise, not. To answer the public opinion. Yes. Public opinion is not uh, totally for uh, gene modified uh, crops. So that's why is it, I mean, it, it, is, it may be necessary to involve all technology institute also, uh, my opinion. Every institution can be involved and if they are invited to give their own comments. So some of these, in fact, documents are always available on the website of the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change. One can always visit and give the comments. Okay, thank you. Yes, welcome. Yes, please. Thank you for brief presentation. Uh, because from morning we are focusing on the climate change. I have one question actually. Uh, does resistant breeding or maybe transgenics uh, really work in altered climatic conditions? Because there may be elevated CO2 levels and a slight increase and decrease in the temperature. Does the resistant breeding really works in that uh, altered climatic scenario? You know, actually speaking, what we are trying to do is whether conventional breeding or any other method of molecular breeding people are trying to use, they are doing resistance breeding, yes, very much. And when we're talking of testing them, they are being tested under different environmental conditions, which are prevailing today, which are prevailing today. We are not going to test them for the futuristic point of view. I can understand what you're trying to say. That are we testing them, for example, if you're predicting that temperature is going to be higher beyond this that's not actually speaking being done at the moment but under the environmental conditions which are there in the different agroecological conditions they're all being tested there we have in our indian council of agriculture research and ECRIP trials we call them which are scattered depending upon a crop different agroecological regions and all those crops before they were bred and varieties released they're all tested under those conditions whether you talk of resistance breeding you talk of advance, advancement in yield or any other trade for that matter so there's a wonderful mechanism we do have but I take your message, yes, probably I will check whether are we going to initiate something of that kind, you know, under stimulated environmental conditions, which we predict, let us say, going to happen, temperature or CO2 from now, 10 years after. Yes, sir. There is one report, actually, in Denmark. One weed is there, one legume is there, Stellantis cabra. Initially, it is having a major disease that is anthracnose, Coltotrichum bluesporides. Uh, slightly rise in 80 ppm of that uh, CO2 levels. The symptoms are more seeing on that resistant breeded varieties rather than susceptible varieties. I'll that be happy to have that paper from you or a reference if you can pass it on to me. Okay, so sure. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, if there are no more questions, once again, I thank the organizers for this opportunity and I'm happy to see some three students still left behind, others have left. Um, because it was lunchtime, they were feeling hungry. So my special thanks to these three beautiful students, 
still you know bearing with, with the presentation thank you very much if you have any question comment you can still make it later during the lunch time thank you all thank you very much thank you thank you so very much sir for the resounding piece of presentation as sir uh, will leave early for his uh, other commitments and uh, the schedule for the day to felicitate uh, sir uh, may I welcome on the stage dr arup kumar mukherjee honorable principal scientist icar national rice research institute katak and uh, honorable president of Society for Agricultural Research and Management. I request her to kindly join us on the stage. And uh, Professor C. Kole, along with Engineer Dibanshu Dash, to kindly come up on the stage to felicitate Professor K. C. Bansal. I request her to kindly be on stage. As he is leaving early uh, due to his other commitments, it's a small token of appreciation from the side of Agrivision 2023, 2023, yes. We are honored to have you here, sir. This is the Lifetime Achievement Award. I would request all of you to kindly give a standing ovation for Professor Casey Bunsell. We congratulate you, sir. A continuous round of applause for Professor Casey Bonsell, everyone. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. Professor Kole and Dr. Das for doing the honor. Next up, we have Dr. J. L. N. Sastri, former CEO, NMPB, and managing partner, Jatas Ayurvedic Healthcare Systems. Let's welcome him. He is uh, joining us shortly. You will be joining post lunch. I would request all of you to kindly have your lunch. Thank you so much. Let us gather.
they will give me an opportunity to have a presentation today. Sir, my name is... In the absence of yes. In the place of absentees. Yes, sir. Yes. My name is Subbar, not listed here. Okay, okay. I'll That's why. Okay, sir. Uh, I will talk and I will see you. Yeah, you talk to Dr. Sridhar and uh, make, make an answer. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you can... Can you, can, yes, uh, can you please send your uh, topic to me? Yes. Can you please send your topic to me so that... Uh, uh, I will send the copy. Uh, only, only the name. Okay, you have, you have sent it. Okay, okay. Huh? You have sent it. Uh, I have, have handed over to you. Uh, and I also I have another copy. If you want, I will give you. I only uh, I only want to know the name of your topic. Okay, my name is M. M. Subbar. Yes, sir. Retired deputy director of the Dutcher. AP. Deputy director. Uh, presentation on agriculture and rural development. Agriculture and rural development. Okay. Uh, the proper title. Mm -hmm. It is the proper title. Okay. Uh, all the presentations are going. Uh, Retired Deputy Director, Agriculture, Waste Department. Yeah. Waste Department. Agriculture Department. Odisha. Oh, no, no, Andhra Pradesh. AP. Government of uh, Andhra Pradesh. Government of AP. Yeah. I mean, retired people not to be connected to either department, government or department. Okay, okay, sir. Please have a seat. Oh. Check. Basically, use for this presentation program. So they just have to do it over here and show the job you should notice. This is the copy. You, you, you the have it. Okay, okay. You have it with you. I have your topic okay. already. And also, somebody was advising, he will include in the soft copy okay. of the presentation. Okay. Printed copy, printing complete over there. Usually, a soft copy include cuts at time. Okay. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back after the lunch break. I hope uh, we were able to build some network during the networking lunch and I cannot emphasize how important it is to have a network when it comes to agri business especially. Moving ahead, next up we have Dr. Ganesh Babu standard biotools singapore and he is talking on high throughput quantitative polymerase chain reaction for plant and animal genomic applications give a big hand for dr ganesh babu everyone yeah thank you everyone uh, so my name is Ganesh. I am from Standard Biotools. If you haven't heard the name Standard Biotools before, you might have heard the name Fluidam actually. That is our company. So we have our offices in San Francisco and Canada and then Singapore actually. So we work in broadly in two areas. One is uh, high throughput genomics and another area is uh, proteomics. So in today's my talk, I will be talking about uh, how we use various tools in uh, high throughput genomics. It's not moving. Next slide. So in today's presentations, I will be talking about uh, high throughput qPCR platforms for a plant and animal genomics application. I hope you might have used a PCR or real time PCR, but it is not just it's not just yet another qPCR machine. So it's entirely very unique and very innovative tool for plant and animal genomics. So when I talk about uh, in a lot, when I talk about in a detail, you will know why is it innovative, 
how it helps for researchers in plant and animal genomics application. Next slide. So in today's presentation, I will be talking about what is unique about uh, standard bio tools qPCR system and then how it works. Basically, I will be explaining about the technology that begins the system. Then I talk about our system X9 real-time PCR system. Then finally, I will be showing some of the applications that commonly used in plant and animal genomics research. Finally, I will be taking up the questions. Yeah, please. Next slide. So why is standard bio tools? There are many companies that makes qPCR around the world. So why, what is unique and what is the value proposition that the standard bio tools brings to the world? So next slides. So if you have used a real-time PCR, you know one of the shortcoming of the conventional uh, real-time PCR is the number of target you can study. So let's say you wanted to do some real-time PCR experiment. So if you use a conventional qPCR system, so you can go maximum of six target. So you can study only maximum of six target if you use a conventional qPCR. Why? Because most of the conventional qPCR system has only six fluorescent channel. So the moment you wanted to study more than six target, you may not able to use a conventional qPCR. Let's say if you wanted to study more than six target from any given sample, you may not able to do use a conventional qPCR or if you use a conventional qPCR, you need to run a multiple reaction. This is one of the shortcoming of conventional qPCR because of the limited fluorescent channel that is available with the conventional qPCR system. And even though there are a six fluorescent channel, you can multiplex up to six, but it is not also easy because when you do, when you do the multiplex reactions, you need to optimize the conditions for the multiplex qPCR. That is also a challenge. So let's assume you have a sample and you wanted to study 96 target from conventional, uh, you wanted to study a 96 different genes or a 96 different target. If you use a conventional qPCR system, let's assume you, you are running your experiment in a 96 well plate. So that means that, that, means that only you can run one sample. You can run only one sample if you use a conventional qPCR when you want to study 96 target. So for multiple target, you need to run a multiple plate. That is a one of the, that that limits the number of sample you can run in your experiment. Next slide. So next slide. Next next slide. So we solve one of these unique problem actually, you can study maximum of 96 or 192 targets simultaneously. And even that is in a single plex reaction, you don't, you are not doing multiplexing. So we solve two problems. So the first problem we solve, you can study up to 192 target simultaneously. And another one problem, you don't need to worry about multiplexing because the, all the reactions happens on a single flex. So these slides is nicely summarized about the power of standard bio tools technology. So this is not the created picture. So this picture is sent to us by one of our customers in US. So in this picture, you can see there are 1,384 uh, well played. So these plates were used by one of our customer in US to do genotyping. So they need to generate 0.5 million genotyping data point. They need to generate a 0.5 million genotyping data point. In order to generate, they need to run 1,384 well plates. So that means that they need to run conventional QPC, real-time PCR, 1,300 time actually. So if they wanted to run this kind of a project, they need to run 1,300 time actually. Let's assume as a human, even if you run a three plates per day, even if you run a three plates per day, how much, how many days, it, you know, this kind of a project is going to take actually. So standard by tools solve one of these unique problem. Next slide. So whatever you did with the 1300 plate, that can be done with as low as a 54 run actually. 
So whatever you did with the 1300 run, that can be scaled down to 54 run. That's the power of the technology that's became. So combinations with our convention, uh, our high throughput QPCR system X9 with our technology. So whatever they did with the 1300 run, that can be scaled down to 54 run. How is it feasible? So what is behind the technology? So when you understand the technology, you know how it works, how we can scale down. Next slides. Yeah, next slide. So our technology is based on microfluidics. So microfluidics is nothing but you miniaturize everything. So whatever you do, you miniaturize everything. But is it is not just microfluidics. So the company has invented and innovated in a very clever way that you can simultaneously study multiple target. So our technology is based on integrated fluid circuit. So our technology is based on integrated fluid circuit. So when you do the real time PCR, you use 96 well plate or a 384 well plate. But in this one, so instead of using a 96 or 384 well plate, we use a special chip we call as a integrated fluid circuit in a short form we call IFC. So in this picture, you can see the middle, middle black color portion that's called the IFC. So that is a very tiny three centimeter into three centimeter square. That tiny portion in the middle, that is only three centimeter into three centimeter square where there are more than 9,000 PCR reaction chamber. In those tiny space has more than 9,000 PCR reaction chambers. So that means that within that tiny space, there are going to be more than 9,000 PCR reaction. On the other, on, if you look at on both the sides, left hand side and right hand side, you can see there are a inlet. Those inlets are called a assay and sample inlets. So you there are a, in this particular rep represented picture here, there are a 96 assay inlet and 96 sample inlets. So you can load simultaneously 96 sample and 96 target. So each target will be integrated for each sample. So that means that it allows you to create 96 into 96 reaction combination. Go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So here you can simple comparisons on the left hand side. If you use a conventional qPCR, so you are, let's say, assume you wanted to study 96 target, you can run only one sample. But, but if you look at here, so in the, in the standard by tools solutions, so you can study 96 sample against 96 target. One more time. So in a simple way to say, you are running only 96 reactions, actually. If you use a conventional QPCR, you are running only 96 reactions or 96 data point. But when you run with the standard bio tools uh, QPCR, so you are going to get about 9,216 data point or reactions. Go to the next slide. So in, in, a, in a nutshell, so these high, high throughput systems allow you to study multiple data point and multiple target simultaneously. So it is scalable while it's providing the high throughput option for you. Go to the next slide. Next slide. So to say it in a simple way, so one run of IFC, one run of IFC, that is equivalent to 96, 96 well plate. So that means that you need to run 96 time conventional QPCR to get the same amount of data you get from X9 system, our system. So I repeat again, so if you want to get the data output you get from one run of X, X9 that is equivalent to 96, 96 well run actually. So that is what this picture represents here. Yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, it is not only throughput, it's also allow you a cost saving. It's not, it's not only throughput, it's allow you to cost saving. So I'm going to talk about and showing in a quantitative way how it allow you to do the cost saving. So let's assume you have 1000 sample, you wanted to target 96 target, it can be gene expression, or it can be genotyping target. 
So that means that you need to generate 96,000 data point. So you need to run, you need to get a 96,000 data point. If you use a conventional real-time PCR and run with the 384 well plate, it's going to take 250 run. So if you use a conventional QPCR, it's going to take 250 run to complete this kind of a project. And for the QPCR master mix alone, you will end up using almost one liter of master mix. For this kind of a project, it will end up, you will be end up using one liter of master mix. If you look at the master mix price alone, the list price alone, it's going to cost 82,000 euro. So for this kind of a project, the master mix alone going to cost 82,000 euro. And it's not only the money and amount of reagent, the time also to complete this kind of a projects with the conventional QPCR, that's going to take almost five months of your time to complete these projects. So, so far you have seen how much time, how many run and how much amount of master mix and how much amount of money you need to spend to get this much data. So one more slide, please. Yeah. So here it's a comparison. So let's assume if you run that with the our standard bio tools, QPCR systems, same amount of samples, same number of targets, and it's going to take only 11 run, 250 run versus 11 run, and amount of master mix. Because the reactions happens on a microfluidics, it's going to consume very, very nanoliter amount of volume of the master mix. So that's what it's going to consume only 2.64 ml, less than 5 ml actually. So one liter versus less than 3 ml of master mix for this kind of a project. So what you are spending for master mix is going to be drastically scaled down to $430 actually. So the 30 euros actually. So compare the price of the master mix you will end up pay, <laughs> paying for this kind of a project. And more importantly, time to data. So it's going to take only four days to complete these kind of projects when you run with this system. So that's the power of the, our system. Next slide, please. So this slide, there will be a video, just play that. So you can, you, you hang, hang, you just bring your cursor over the thing you can see on the bottom and you can click, then it will play. Yeah. Okay, go to the next slide. Yeah. So here I'm showing our X9 instruments. Yeah, next slide. So this is our PCR system. So this is a system that we use to run these IFCs. So this is called a X9. It's a real-time PCR system. So it can be used for your quantitative and qualitative experiment. So you can use this system. Let's assume you are running a gene expression. It can be used actually for your gene expression experiment because it's a real-time PCR system. It measures the expression in real time. And it's not only for the gene expression, it can be also used for genotyping. So let's assume if you are doing any genotyping, it can be used for your genotyping experiment as well. And so if you have this kind of a system in a one day, you can generate more than 46,000 data point. In a one day, in a eight hour shift, you can generate more than 46,000 data point. And you can simultaneously study 96 target and you don't need to do any optimizations. And again, this system is easy to operate. Everything can be operated from your touch screen. You don't need to do even more in system is more intelligence and that also recognized based on the IFC we use, what kind of experiment you are running and that will select automatically that protocol that need to be selected for the experiment. So go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So here is a workflow, how the systems work. The, 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 this picture shows the complete workflow of the system. So you, you can, ext first thing it started from extracted DNA. So the DNA can be extracted from your, 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 your sample of interest. It can be a plant or it can be a animal tissue or human sample. So extract a DNA. So DNA is a starting material. So the next one is designing the assays. 
so you the you can either you can design your own primer or you can use a tackman assays or you can also use our we have our own genotyping solutions that's called a snip type assays so we have an online tool where you can design a primer for your experiments so that tool is called a d3 uh, uh, online tool where you can designs uh, assays for your experiment so once you have assays and samples are ready you use a multi channel pipette and transfer the sample to uh, ifc so you can use a multi channel pipette to transfer the samples and assays and once you transfer the sample you put it into the qpcr system that's called a x9 system and you uh, then in 2 hours 15 minutes time so you will have a data point of more than 9000 reaction data point in a 2 hours time so then finally you can analyze the data using our online tool that we have online software that can be used for analyze so uh, we have a three different types of ifc to meet different throughput the first I, so if you look at the bottom you can see that the, there are different numbers that represents the different types of IFC. So for an example, 96.96 means the nine, you can run 96 sample against 96 target. 192.24 means you can run 192 sample against 24 target. Uh, and then 48.48 .48 means that you can run 48 sample against 48 uh, different assays or different primers. So here the first number that denotes the number of sample you can run. The second number denote the number of assays you can run actually. Yeah, go to the next slide. So here I'm going to show you some, so there are more than thousands of publications that have used our platform around the world. It's, and it's not a new technology. It's been for in the market for 10 years and worldwide many researchers have used and published thousands of papers. So here I'm going to show some of the relevant example that is related to plant genomics applications. Go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So as we know that when it comes to plant, so the plant, plant biologist used various techniques for molecular biology techniques in a different stage of their applications. So it, molecular techniques are used in plant breeding and it pre-breeding stages it is used to during the breeding and it is used during the quality control stages so in different stages different tools are used uh, for an example uh, snb genotyping uh, by pcr it's commonly used during the breeding stage and uh, led, and then uh, high density markers like a whole genome sequencing or genome wide uh, microarray genome wide association studies are usually done during the pre pre breeding stages so during the pre breeding stages we need to study lot of markers because we need to screen the plant of our interest for our experiments so you are you are screening the stock that's required for your experiment but when it comes to breeding you don't need to do whole genome sequencing or microarray. First thing, it is costly. But then during the breeding stage, you are going to screen hundreds of uh, plants to select your marker of interest for the marker resisted selection. So you need to screen only limited marker. So those times you need, you, you can't use a conventional PCR, you need a more marker. So that stage standard pi tools uh, qPCR system x9 is commonly used during the breeding stage. Apart from breeding, the, it is also used during the quality control stages. So let's say you are making a new seed, you are going about to release the seed. So it is if it is a, you know if it is a GMO or it is a newly developed variety, you need to test the quality of the seeds before release. So that that. Uh, X9 system also used for the quality control stages or as well. So where usually people study like 10 markers or 15 markers simultaneously from any given sample. So in a nutshell, different tools are used in different stages. So usually that all breeding, uh, pre, uh, breeding projects, they start with the pre-breeding. That stage microarray are used or sequencing is used. And then, when, then once they narrow down the plants of their interest, when it goes to the breeding stage, the people use standard bio tools uh, x9 systems worldwide to screen for the marker assisted selections next slide please yeah 
so here is an one example how that uh, you know one of our one of the researcher in south korea he used our system for uh, marker assisted selection for the qtl identification so in these projects uh, they wanted to study about uh, so this work is published in uh, agriculture 2021 so this article is from pusan national university so in this work uh, they wanted to identify the qtl that is associated with the rice grain size and grain length and the fragrance of the rice so they selected lot of mark they selected more than 192 snip they are known to associated with and from that they wanted to narrow down to few snips they wanted to identify the few snips that is really related to the grain uh, grain size so for this project they use the ifc because this for this project ifc is particularly valuable because they wanted to study 192 target simultaneously so this kind of a project cannot be run with a conventional qpcr because they need to study 192 target if they use a conventional qpcr that's going to be many years to time to complete this kind of a project so and it's not only uh, high throughput it's also provided a cost effective way that is a main reason they use this technology for their qtl identification work so this article is published in agriculture 2021 next slide please yeah it is not only used for marker assisted selection and qtl it can be also used for plant pathogen detection so this is an another example so when it comes to plant pathogen there are hundreds of pathogens actually so if you use a conventional qpcr system you need to do the reflex testing what i mean the reflex testing is so you know that there are hundreds of pathogens so if you test for one pathogen and then the you know the result stands out negative that doesn't mean that there is no pathogen only that pathogen is not present so that's what you need to test for the another pathogens continuously till you find out if there is any problem with you know any diseases so here you can study simultaneously the multiple target so you don't need to do reflex testing for this particular work as a proof of concept uh, researchers from uh, forest research institute they wanted to study simultaneously 11 uh, pathogen simultaneously so because if they use a conventional qpcr they need to do the reflex testing so they ifc has an uh, advantage you, uh, because you can study multiple targets simultaneously they choose particularly this approach to study multiple pathogens simultaneously yeah next slide please so next next click next 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 yeah so here how the seed companies used actually because seed companies it is very critical before they release their seeds for to, to before sell they need to do the quality control first place they need to do the quality control because they need to check there is a 90% 95% of the purity in their seeds they are selling that's what they need to do the testing so here this slide shows how the seed companies uses so there is a seed company that use our solution so they screen more than 2000 uh, 200k samples every year so for this work they need to screen 20 snips from each sample they need to screen 20 snips from uh, every every sample so if they use a conventional technology they need to do the multiple uh, they need to run a multiple plate to get the data so for this scenario in this particular scenario so they need to study 20 snip so the beauty of that some snips are common among all the plant species they use so they have a different they need to study different plant species but some snips are common some snips are different actually so they were using a different technology that has a pre spotted they had a pre spotted snips so that means that each species they need to order a different pre spotted array so they need to order a pre, they need to order pre spotted array for brinjal separate and then they separate for the watermelon separate for the cucumber so they need to order a different pre spotted arrays in spite they share a common snips and only that few snips are different yeah, go to next slide please so when they heard about our so our solutions because our solutions are not pre spotted so assays are supplied so that means that you can omit 
the assays shared among all the species, you can order only the unique assays. And you can use the same assays when you do the experiment because it is not pre-spotted. So for these projects, so if you use a pre-spotted, you need to stock up hundreds of assays for them actually. For this case, because they are studying a 200K, so they need to stock up the uh, pre-spotted assays in a lot of lot of quantity. So when when they use a standard bio tool solution, they don't need to stock up anything. So they can simply use. Uh, they can they don't need to pre-spot. They can buy the IFC and then they can custom on the on the go. They can customize whatever the assays they want. But in pre-spotted, the problem is if you use a pre pre-spotted. In any case, you can't change your mind because it's pre-spotted. Only way, let's say if you find out some new SNPs you wanted to add, you need to throw actually the array card. You need to buy a new one actually. But here, you don't need to throw anything. Just simply take out the assays you are not interested and put the new assays. So that is the beauty of the technology here. Yeah. Go to the next one, please. Yeah, go next one. Yeah. So here I'm going to show you some of the examples how it is used in animal health. Apart from plant, it is also used in animal health. So, uh, so even in animal health, it is also for animal breeding. So for this particular work, they wanted to uh, study some of the SNPs associated with the HSPB1 genes. So they use, because they need to study the multiple target from these particular things that is associated with the heat shock protein. So that is related to the meat, meat quantity actually. So this work is uh, from uh, South Korea. So they are they published in Archives of Animal Breeding in 2020. So this work also they use our platform because they can study multiple target while it's provide a cost effective solutions. Go to the next one. Yeah, go next. So when it comes to animal, so animal also has a lot of pathogens. So when it comes to seek actually, uh, you know, it can be a bacterial infections or it can be a fungal infection or it can be a virus or viroid or nematode infections. So when animal is sick, actually by symptoms, you can't say, you know, simply you can't say, you know, is, is it infected with the bacteria or by fungi and virus and nematode, you know, with a hundred percent sure actually whether is it infected with a particular pathogen. So it need to be tested. Uh, go to next slide. Yeah, if you use a conventional qPCR, yeah, go to next slide, please. Yeah, if you use a conventional qPCR, the problem with this again, you may suspect the bacterial disease. You may look for one of the particular pathogens, and then you will be, you know, if the result stands out negative, and then uh, you need to repeat again for the another pathogen, and you need to go on, go on till find out what pathogen is really present. So that's the problem. So that means that you need to do multiple reflex testing until you find out the pathogens of, you know, the pathogen is present or not actually. But when you use this one, so you can put, I know the target of multiple pathogens in a one IFC. So you can simultaneously study all the pathogen in a one go actually. So you don't need to do reflex texting because on the go, you can study multiple pathogen. For this particular work, so they study about 11 pathogens simultaneously. But is, it is not limited to 11. As you know that we have a, you can study up to 96 target simultaneously. So it's, it's not limited to 11, but as a proof of concept, they have shown with 11, but even you can go up to 192 maximum, even without doing multiplexing, actually, even if you want to optimize multiplexing, it can be also done actually. Yeah. Go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So that's all actually. So I'll be happy to take any questions. So if you have, thank you very much for listening. Yeah. The, hello. The nematodes are multicellular, and bacteria, we know that these are all uh, very minute and uh, or, or organisms. So, how they are going to differentiate basically when they are having two types of infections? Okay. So, the thank you for the question. So, the, the test is based on your DNA marker, actually. So, let's say if you have a nematode pathogen, so that's going to have a very unique primus that is going to amplify the target only from your nematode actually. And for bacteria, as say, similarly, you are going to have a particular marker that is unique to particular pathogens actually. So that's what it's not a morphological. So it's not, uh, you know, it's based on a DNA marker. So 
for an example if the nematode is present so that's going to give a amplification signal only for the nematode actually if it is bacteria is present but for the particular pathogen it is going to give a signal only for the pathogen so that's how so, it's yeah it's going to be very specific also i mean if you choose this, for... yeah it is going to be very specific it depends how how well designed your assays or probe or primer actually for particular pathogen so if, so before any assays is developed you need also need to validate whether it's give any non specific amplification or not or it is very specific to your target of interest yeah yeah thank you, thank you. Three different type of instrument for three different type of things: genotyping, expression, as well as SNP genotyping or sequencing. Now the point is that you are mentioning only one instrument, so that means there are different modules. Or uh, I mean, what is the actual thing? There is the one type of workstation, or uh, what is the instrument actually? So the X9 system hmm. at the moment it can do both genotyping and gene expression. So in both the case it's a pcr right pcr reaction actually so amplification so so for gene expression so we use only one probe like you know usually it lab label with the fam or you can use any conventional primer you use actually for genotyping so it's usually based on allele specific pcr okay so there is a chemistry that's called allele specific pcr that can be also done so uh, for uh, so for genotyping if you use a Tacman Tacman probe, it, it is uh, you can use all the Tacman assays with our system. So if you use a Tacman, you can run in real time. But if you use a uh, SNP type chemistry or other allele specific chemistry, it can be detect the end point. So that means that it can be used for gene expression and uh, genotyping. It is single model actually. It's not uh, because at the end of the day, it's a PCR. So uh, that's what you can run in a single model. But in uh, in another few months. You can also do library preparations actually that will be coming up soon actually so you can use a one system for targeted ngs library preparation but that will be a new model actually additional module with the systems so you are providing service or you are providing the instrument yeah one instrument yeah what only is the, one what is the present cost of this type of instrument so i'm not sure the future car but uh, you know definitely we can get back to you if you can you know we can talk and you know you can leave a, your email then we can get back to you on the pricing actually so it is in india it is available now uh, yeah india it is available actually in india there are many institutes uses our system but not the x9 actually x9 is recently launched uh, different institutes different you know agriculture universities they own our system that's a previous version of our system they own actually yeah Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Gonis Babu, for talking on the advanced uh, and developed mode of PCR technique for the plant and animal genomic applications. Moving on, we have Dr. Abhimanyu Sarkar, group leader, legume genetic, NIAB UK, and he will be talking on developing an orphan legume for protein nutritional security in the 21st century. Can you please have Dr. Abhimanyu Sarkar? Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, I'll be sharing my screen now. So can you hear me, everybody? Yes, sir, we right. can hear you. Please go okay. ahead. Thank you. So, um, yeah. 
So I'm uh, going to be talking about uh, protein nutritional security and uh, uh, our work on uh, the uh, orphan legume uh, grass pea, uh, which is uh, Lathyrus sativus, also known as Kayseri, uh, and how uh, we developed uh, resources to breed uh, uh, improved uh, low neurotoxin varieties in this particular legume. So. Now, uh, as you know, the world faces multiple challenges uh, um, to feed the growing population. Uh, and the world population is projected to increase uh, by nearly a quarter uh, from current levels of around 8 billion to nearly 10 billion uh, in less than um, 30 years. And most of the addition of this population will be in developing countries. For example, Africa will uh, add more than a billion uh, people by 2050 uh, from the current levels. And uh, protein availability is probably the most critical limitation in achieving uh, adequate human nutrition. Now, the current dependence on animal sources of protein is not sustainable, uh, sustainable in the face of uh, climate change. So, uh, and in the context of the Indian agriculture, uh, India will need to feed probably uh, around 300 million or 30 crore people more uh by 2050 and uh, climate change is already impacting yield sustainability uh, for example last year's heat wave uh, reduced india's wheat production uh, by uh, a few million tons which uh, impacted uh, the world's availability of wheat uh, which is also uh, impacted by the war in ukraine uh, other factors that uh, are impacting uh, world uh, food security uh, include soil degradation and uh, uh, the um, impact of war and other uh, geopolitical factors on nitrogen availability. So the oil prices are increasing. Uh, fertilizer availability uh, is decreasing because of the fertilizer prices increases. Now, legumes offer a solution to some of these challenges, but we need to breed uh, climate smart varieties of uh, various legumes. So we need, uh, when we start a breeding program, we need to uh, figure out what our objectives are uh, to be able to develop these climate smart legumes. Uh, one of the most important uh, aspect of any breeding program is that the breeder looks to develop uh, varieties with higher yields. But we also need to have short duration varieties because we want to fit them in uh, agriculture rotations uh, and also uh, reduce input usage, which can be achieved by short duration varieties. Uh, this is very um, uh, important, especially when we talk about uh, water use efficiency. So if you can cut down on, uh, on one irrigation during the crop cycle, that uh, gives us substantial savings in terms of uh, water usage. Uh, but for legumes especially, uh, there is another very important uh, aspect that we need to um, uh, C, uh, and that is uh, yield stability, uh, even in face of climate or resource challenges. Uh, so we are looking for tolerance to abiotic stresses, for example, uh, uh, salinity, drought, heat, or cold uh, flooding. Uh, we are also looking uh, for resistance to biotic stresses. Uh, we are looking at a good germination or establishment. Uh, so these are the uh, traits, uh, of course, and we are looking for high water usage and uh, nutrient usage efficiency. Uh, the other thing that we uh, look for are, uh, in legumes are, of course, uh, 
quality traits, for example, the protein content, as well as the absence of anti-nutritional factors. So, Uh, the crop that I'm talking going to talk about is grass pea, and this is very unique is that in that it, it can grow when other crops fail. Uh, and uh, what you're seeing on my screen, and I'm sorry about this particular bar um, here, I don't know if you can see this, uh, but this is actually a landscape in Ethiopia where uh, the chickpea crop had failed. So the farmers uh, actually just put out grass pea seed and without any additional irrigation, this is a seven week old grass pea crop that germinated on the residual moisture. And now you can see a green field. Uh, but if you look closely, there are very few volunteer chickpea uh, that have emerged, but uh, this is actually a grass pea growing in a field that chickpea uh, did not germinate very well. So this crop originated in the Balkan Peninsula in Europe, but it's mainly grown in the Indian subcontinent uh, and in Africa for food, feed and fodder. And it's a very hardy legume and is often used as the last resort against starvation when there is drought or famine. So, but there is, uh, amino acid, uh, uh, that's a neurotoxin uh, that is present in all aerial parts of grass pea, which limits its use, usage. And that's called beta ODAP. And beta ODAP can cause neurolatherism on prolonged consumption when this is the uh, major source of uh, protein. So basically uh, it, it causes paralysis of the lower limbs. Now, because of this, grass pea was banned in several countries, including in India. And even now there are uh, limitations uh, in its usage in the manufactured food chain. So this is a very important limitation for uh, wi more widespread usage of grass pea, even though it's a very hardy crop grown by farmers. Uh, so we wanted to uh, figure out how to uh, overcome this challenge of uh, having grass be uh, limited by the presence of beta ODAP. So our solution uh, or the solution of the breeders uh, basically uh, has been to uh, breed for uh, low ODAP grass pea, but nobody has uh, uh, achieved zero ODAP uh, grass pea so far. So we first started to look at the existing variation uh, at a global level uh, and our screen of global germplasm failed to find novel low ODAP grass pea lines in non-improved material. We looked at over 200 uh, plus lines uh, of uh, grass pea from uh, various seed banks, including the USDA, IPK and the germplasm resource unit at GIC, but uh, we did not get any low ODAP and we defined low ODAP as uh, something that has got less than 0.1% ODAP in uh, the seed uh, on a dry weight basis. Um, we also characterize the germplasm accessions for protein, starch, uh, and other uh, characters. Uh, we also did some field phenotyping for crop phenology and disease resistance over uh, several years. So if we could not find variation naturally, we look to create the variation that would allow us to select for low ODAP. And uh, we achieved this by uh, carrying out EMS mutagenesis, uh, followed by a forward screen for low ODAP mutants. Uh, so this is a non-GM approach. And uh, our uh, collaborator uh, at Bench Bio Limited uh, created a population of uh, 3000 plus M2 families. Uh, which we then screened by the Rao method. And uh, uh, Peter Emmerich was a PhD student at that time. He identified 14 low ODAP uh, uh, mutants. 
and I'll show you the data next. So this is looking at uh, the GRASP uh, C ODAP concentration in seeds. And if you look at some of the uh, high ODAP uh, GRASP, um, uh, there is this European type L007 uh, that we will come across um, because we have sequenced the genome of this one. And then there is LSTW11, uh, which was the basis or the parental line for the um, mutagenized population. Uh, when we did our assays, uh, we had P and chick P as a control, so that showed a zero ODAP. We looked at certain existing low ODAP varieties, and uh, there's Mahateora uh, and Seora from Australia, uh, and Mahateora is an Indian variety. These came as reliably very low ODAP uh, varieties. Uh, there is a Canadian material LS8246, uh, P24, which was the uh, in yellow, which is the original source of the low ODAP uh, phenotype in most of the uh, Indian uh, low ODAP varieties that had been released till date. Uh, but some of the ones uh, like Nirmal and Ratan. Uh, showed elevated levels of ODAP uh, when we tested it in the laboratory. But the green ones uh, are, are the levels of ODAP for some of the mutant lines that we had created. Uh, and there were at least four uh, lines of uh, these mutants that were lower than the lowest available uh, low ODAP variety uh, that had already been released. So this was promising material that we then put into the breeding pipeline. So the other thing that we created were transcriptome resources. Uh, we looked at multiple transcriptomes from both high and low ODAP lines. Uh, and we ended up with over uh, two and a half billion RNA-seq paired in reads. Uh, we got these reads from the uh, high ODAP uh, Indian uh, variety that we had got from the USDA. Uh, we got uh, LS007, which is a high ODAP European line, mm -hmm. and Mahateora, which is a released low ODAP uh, Indian variety. Um, and we phenotyped them under uh, both normal as well as under drought conditions. And we um, took tissue samples uh, to do RNA-seq. And this data served as very uh, uh, useful uh, resource for a gene model and annotation, as well as for freight discovery in our subsequent work. So we also then sequence the genome of the graspy because this is what was uh, lacking before. And this would allow us uh, not only uh, enable us for uh, to develop markers, but also allow us to um, sort of look at uh, novel traits and novel alleles. So graspy is a deployed, it's 2N is 14. And the line that we uh, sequenced originally is the LS007. Uh, we uh, took a, initially we took a whole genome shotgun sequencing approach on the Illumina platform and achieved around 64x coverage uh, on using paired end sequencing of amplification free libraries. Uh, we then did some mate pair libraries to uh, uh, sort of um, build contigs and scaffold uh, this. Uh, um, these sequences further. Uh, and we initially ended up with a assembly that was nearly 8 GB, uh, but had around 2 GB worth of ends. So that's, that's a pretty, uh, not exactly a very good quality library, but we reported this in 2020 in BioArchive. We then turned around and we uh, tried to increase the length and remove the ends in our assembly using nanopole long read sequencing. Uh, and then uh, basically uh, after filtering, we got uh, 35X coverage. And we used uh, software to 
polish the assembly. Uh, uh, and uh, this red bean assembly we uh, polished using Minimap and the original Illumina data. So we ended up with around a 6.2 uh, GB um, assembly uh, that had no ends. Uh, so, and the N50 was uh, around 158 uh, KB for the Contig. Uh, this was again a pretty fragmented assembly around 163,000 um, Contigs, uh, but we were able to identify nearly uh, 34,000 uh, high confidence gene models. And uh, we realized we had uh, captured around 83% of the gene space uh, when we did the BUSCO. Uh, this assembly, uh, its annotation, uh, and its annotation has been accepted in Nature Communication in principle. So we are just uh, formatting this and hopefully this will come out uh, quite soon uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, but since then, we have improved the assembly uh, using uh, PacBio sequencing, uh, HiFi um, uh, sequencing, and uh, scaffolding. And we have a very um, good quality um, assembly now, uh, which is around uh, six, again, around 6.1 uh, GB. And this um, in that assembly, um, the BUSCO score is nearly 99%. So we are quite confident that we have captured in our new assembly, which we haven't published uh, or yet. Um, we have captured most of the gene space uh, in GRASP. So that's a very important advance for us. The other uh, thing that we did was to look at the um, global diversity collection from ICARDA and, um, sorry, um, we obtained around 435 lines out of which we resequenced 354 to around 10X coverage. Um, and this is towards uh, developing a ecotilling platform where we look at uh, uh, the sequence variation that is already available uh, in the uh, global collection at the molecular level. And again, we did paired in sequencing of amplification free libraries. Uh, we also uh, sequenced an additional 30 recombinant inbred lines, which are a cross between the low ODAP, uh, sorry, between the LSWT11, which is the Indian uh, type, and a European type, the LS007, whose genome sequence we know now. So uh, using these data sets, we uh, developed uh, markers, uh, SNP markers, identified SNPs and indels, and uh, are validating some of the markers and developing some uh, assays uh, to assist us in our breeding program. So this ecotilling platform uh, is now in development at the John Innes Center for allele discovery and uh, we hope that this will be available to the broader community uh, in the uh, coming year. So I talked about the Graspri uh, inbred lines. Uh, we have uh, three real populations uh, that are useful for trait mapping uh, and these would, uh, they are also useful uh, as a sort of the entry into our breeding program. Uh, so this is a resource that, again, we hope to make available to the wider community. We also developed a GRASP speed breeding protocol. Uh, uh, this is published uh, uh, in Nature Protocols uh, in 2018. This allows us to speed the breeding um, program. Uh, and allow us to very rapidly progress generations, uh, and which is very useful when preserving diversity between generations is not critical. So for example, uh, when we are developing inbred or homozygous lines. So just to summarize, uh, we took an orphan crop 
and we developed genetic and genomic resources resources uh, that had become uh, whose lack had become a major bottleneck for crop improvement uh, so uh, this was uh, when i was at the john innes center and we were collaborating with nayab which is where i currently am now uh, but also with ikarda ilri the queensland university of technology to develop a gene editing platform uh, a bckv uh, in bengal who were uh, our collaborators in the initial uh, phase of our project. Bench Bio, who made the population, uh, the mutagenous population, and Ulham Institute, who helped with uh, sequencing and annotating the uh, grasp genome. Uh, we also added other collaborators as we went along, including the University of Nottingham, who helped us with the nanopore sequencing. We ended up creating a reference genome, transcriptomic resources, uh, low ODAP lines, which now serve as a novel source of the uh, low beta ODAP phenotype that can go into the breeding program. Uh, uh, and we also have a, a gene editing platform now that's nearly ready. Uh, we have proof of uh, concept. Uh, we will be deploying it for traits of interest uh, fairly soon. And we have uh, 384 uh, genomes that have been resequenced. So marker uh, validation uh, is now in progress. We have identified a lot of markers that would be useful uh, in our breeding program. Uh, and we are also uh, looking at um, the um, so rolling out the ecotelling platform for allele discovery. So uh, that's what uh, genomics uh, genomics uh, has enabled us to achieve. Uh, and this was a fairly low resource uh, program. So. It, we, we did not get a lot of funding, but we uh, managed through collaborations to actually um, achieve what we did. Um, and I would like to thank all our collaborators, um, uh, including uh, people from uh, India um, and also um, from Ikarda Ilri, the Queensland University of Technology, uh, Crop Trust, and the Templeton World Charitable Fund. Uh, also, BBSRC, which is uh, UK's um, research funding agency uh, for all the uh, funding and support that we have received throughout the project. So, um, and um, yeah, and I would also like to uh, thank uh, Professor Kole, uh, who has uh, mentored some of our uh, thinking in terms of developing climate smart crops. Um, and that's, that's our discussions with him have been very useful. So thank you. And I would, I'm open to questions. And I do apologize for my voice. Um, uh, I'm, I'm recovering from... Um, Thank yeah, you. Thank okay. you so much, Dr. Sarkar, for the excellent presentation. A uh, round of applause for Dr. Bhumanu Sarkar, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for the no rounding presentation and your valuable time. Any questions? Yes. Uh, can we pass the microphone? Dr. Sarkar, uh, there is a question we are taking it up. Yeah, please. Hello? Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Dr. B.C. Tripathi is uh, asking a question. Yes. Hmm. Are you able to hear me? Yes, now I can hear you, sir. Okay. Uh, which gene you have the... Uh, uh, mutations uh, so that you get low ODAP concentration. Okay, so yes. the the pathway that was elucidated by uh, 
uh, Professor uh, SNL Rao's group. Uh, so we uh, we have some mutations in that, but uh, our uh, recent uh, the the upcoming paper in Nature Communications, we have uh, actually uh, identified other genes, other uh, sort of variation in the pathway. The classical pathway for ODA biosynthesis is uh, we have managed to update that uh, based on our uh, knowledge of the genomics. So uh, uh, these genes, they just exist as numbers right now, but uh, they have they got to do both with the, um, um, oxa, the oxalate uh, uh, branch as well as the BIA synthase uh, branch. Uh, and uh, th there's a quite a bit of biochemistry in the background I, I, I can share uh, with you uh, if you... Uh, we haven't actually published some of this work, so that's why I'm a bit reluctant to talk about this, but we have identified genes that uh, if we knock them out, uh, they should be uh, reducing the um, ODAP uh, levels. If you identify the gene, then it's very easy to remove the by knock, knock for technology now. Yeah, so that's that's where we are headed, uh, but it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, the thing is that the uh, there is a reason why people, a uh, lot of breeders around the world, they have always got very low ODAP, but they have never been able to get zero ODAP. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, there is a, uh, excuse me, there is a um, branch in the pathway uh, which allows ODAP uh, to be synthesized even if you knock out the major uh, genes in the pathway. So it, it's, it's a very complex reaction. Um, so uh, that's we have now identified genes, so we would need to knock down a uh, knockout. Uh, we think more than one gene uh, uh, to actually effectively uh, reduce ODAP uh, levels uh, to zero. So even our mutations that we have got, we get them to very low ODAP uh, that are almost undetectable by the Rao method, but are detectable by other methods that we have uh, developed, uh, but we can still not, we have still not got to zero ODAP, uh, and that's the next challenge. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, sir, for the question. Thank you, Dr. Sarkar, for answering the question. We wish you all the luck and success for your future endeavors. Thank you for getting connected. Thank you very Moving much. Moving ahead. Moving ahead. Now, let us welcome Dr. Soren Das. Indian Statistical Institute, Barakpur, India. And he is talking on shelf life of different processed tea, an estimation in relation to their antioxidant potentialities. Give it off for Dr. Soren Das, everyone.
good afternoon uh, everybody i'm talking about uh, what it, the most common and uh, i think uh, it is mass touching beverage tea uh, we are lucky that tea doesn't have or need not any promotional advertisement like this we take tea by practice only by habit only now as tea is a consumable beverage then it should have some date of expiry at least uh, the package tea should have loose tea now we don't have any guarantee that some destroy when how much it have the shelf life but on the package tea it should have some best use best before use like that tag should be there as tea uh, mostly tea we take by habit it is true but there are some beneficiary uh, effect from tea as because tea is a good replacement of an antioxidant elements supplement of antioxidant elements or tea mostly refreshing apart from refreshing tea has some health benefit uh, utility also uh, day by day we know that tea not only a simple beverage but it in ancient china it, it is used as as a medicine also but then uh, how can you determine the shelf life and uh, that means uh, how much day it uh, have some the best before use like that before that down okay <clears throat> some normally tea is ingested by with just uh, hot water and it is origin from china but subsequently it is popularized in asia and europe america like this no matter in which season you can take tea every season you can take tea tea mostly uh, we take uh, broadly categorized two types of tea one is for flavor and another is for um, just tea getting some refreshing element right its benefit go for beyond refreshment numerous studies though these studies doesn't have any uh, medical data still um, different author described it can prevent cardiovascular disease it can lower rise sugar blood sugar etc etc journal of preventive cardiology involved more than 1000 1 lakh adults in china and found those who are regularly drink tea are less likely to develop cardiovascular disease or form of stroke uh, tea uh, different type of tea is there green tea blue, black tea oolong tea white tea like this green tea is exceptionally high flavonoid content and that is uh, we know that flavonoid is a polyphenol and it boosts boost up the heart health by lowering the bad cholesterol and reducing the blood clotting element other research found that green tea has possible impact on liver mind that possible impact though there are no some correlation direct correlation or medical data uh, clinical data rather on these aspects still authors are showing that several results suggest that habitual tea consumption may be considered as a overall health promoting lifestyle behavior uh, we can remember that um, in my childhood people uh, or my parents are always telling don't take tea it um, uh, spoil your liver but nowadays it is 
prove that it is not true. In recent year, matcha tea from a green tea, it is grown in popularity. Matcha is very fine, high quality green tea, powdered made from the entire leaves of tea bushes grown in the shed, tea shed. Like this, uh, there are some uh, uh, several, if you get 10 cups of regular green tea, in fact, it is a good source of flavonoid, No, no, it's not reaching, reaching, no, okay. Uh, but in white tea, it is a uh, least processed tea, may also be good for teeth. Hot chloride, catechin, like this, oolong tea, partially oxidized, is Notable for containing L-theanine. L-theanine can uh, uh, reduce the Alzheimer's disease. It, it is demand that like this. And scientists have found that L-theanine can help prevent congenitive disease of Parkinson and Al Alzheimer. Oolong tea has also high polyphenol, which are linked to lower inflammation, preventing the growth of cancer. I doubt how much it works cancer. Still, there are some reports. Tea production is a uh, very nice, only restricted to some to, uh, East Asian country or some African countries. China, India, Kenya, and Sri Lanka mainly, they're, they're running who are producing higher, higher tea like this. But one thing is that Kenya is a small uh, country, but uh, when the export qual quantity, Kenya is the highest one, almost not highest, second best after China. The graph showing that production of tea from 200, 2006 to 2020 worldwide, somehow lowered down in 20, 2020 in China, 2.74 million metric tons to 2.8 uh, 2 million metric tons to 2.74 metric ton in 2019-90 uh, to 2020. This is because of some uh, uh, disturbance in COVID situation like this, I think. And tea production and export like this, graphical representation, world tea production like this and export is the lower one, lower graph is export. Now, mostly two type of tea export by different countries, Sri Lanka, Kenya, and India, China also, green tea and black tea. We found that black tea export is much more than green tea by different countries. But the prediction from the, uh, after 2020 like this, the green tea somehow popular, getting more, much more popularized because of that, uh, that only that green tea has some uh, ex excess polyphenol like this, not excess, as because green tea is less uh, processed tea, it has some more, much more uh, antioxidant value, though there are some hazardous impact also. This is global production of tea per ton, and the lower one is the uh, economic value of the exports. China is running uh, highest and Kenya is running behind Sri Lanka and India is fourth. So India, Indian production is not too much less, but Indian people consume much more than the export. That's why in export, India is fourth. Probably Kenya uh, exports all tea 
the, the, that the, they are produce, product produced. This graph says that temporal world tea production in tons from 1970 to 2020, 10 years interval, it can be found that how much production in tea is increasing from 1970 to 2020. This is and several factors influencing demand for tea, including price, income, valuable, demographic such as age, education, occupation, and cultural background. Growing consumption of tea producing countries, driven by population and income growth, has translated in a decrease of exportable production over the past two decades. Now coming to the Indian tea. Major tea production in India from 2017 to 2021 and 2022 and the export. Export somehow is uh, lowering from 2019 to 2022. Uh, this is because of, I think, uh, some problem is there in uh, 2018. 2018, yes, sorry, I can remember. <coughs> Uh, some tea is uh, getting refunded from the outside because of the their residual um, fertilizer like that they found. As 2018 survey, a total of like this 6.37 lakh hectares are cultivated in the Indian tea production. The northern part of the India is the biggest producer. Northern part means Assam, North Bengal, etc. And Asham Valley and Kachar are the two tea producing region the West, in West Bengal, Duars, Tarai, and Darjeeling. But the major uh, production, exportable tea production uh, produced by the Asham Valley. But uh, in terms of, if you uh, get the, in terms of money, Darjeeling tea is much more getting the foreign income. India among the first top five tea exporters in the world. The types of tea exported through India are black tea, green tea, and oolong tea. White tea is very much costly, but uh, white tea, how it's prepared, do you know? White tea is just a, just a leaf when the leaf is not came out, come out. Does not have the green color. Chlorophyll, it doesn't form the chlorophyll. That's why it is tough to collect single leaf from each and every plant. That from that leaf, it is white tea is produced. This is uh, tea history, like this. Now, the beneficial role of tea, um, actually, if you judge the self life of tea, there are several um, things how it preserved how the microbial contaminated contamination can be prevented etc et but uh, this is not my cup of tea i i only concentrate the amount of antioxidant element de depleted over the time only thing and there are several parameters of tea quality depreciation but if you concentrate in one single account that Antioxidant element, how it depleted, depletes throughout the time. Which are the antioxidant element? Some enzymatics and non-enzymatic also. Catalase, superoxide dismutase, glutamine reductase, like these. Some ROS, RNS, scavenger also. Some polyphenol, non-enzymatic poly poly polyphenol carotenoids, vitamin C, those are the antioxidant elements. Now, the antioxidant and free radical scavenging machinery comprises enzymatic and non-enzymatic system, which, are, which regulate biotic and abiotic stress and provided the sustainability. Occurrence of non-enzymatic antioxidant molecules are key component of processed tea and stands for the major health benefit aspects of the tea. Though 
we said that there are some health benefit aspects in tea, but those health benefit as aspects never sustain over the time in the package tea. It have some degradation time, degradation value. If you measure the degradation value in a uh, methodical period, uh, in a definite time interval, then you can judge the how antioxidant element, uh, elements are deplet depleting throughout the time. How, how long you can judge that, that uh, when the antioxidant element uh, efficiency coming to the zero, then it is uh, useless. No, not only that. You have to restrict in a cer certain point, 50%, 75%, 50%, 25%. I just like this, that 50%, 75%, 50%, and 25% antioxidant value degradation, I just marked. And that is, I, uh, we, we just uh, named as the self-life of the tea. Now, tea, uh, four types of tea, white tea, green tea, oolong tea, black tea, but all tea is, is produced from the same, same plant, Familiar Chinensis, but only the difference is the processing mechanism. Plucking of the leaf and weathering, this is the common. White tea doesn't have some any steaming or pan frying, drying, rolling like this, directly drying, and white tea is produced. Green tea somehow steaming. Rolling, drying. Mostly processed tea is black tea. Rolling, CTC or orthodox, fermentation, oxidation, drying, then packed for the market. That means white tea is the less, least processing tea. Green is the, more than white and oolong is more than green, and black is the mostly processed tea. We took packaged, packeted material in the same date, same level, same batch processed tea, conventional process, storage material in a, in a room temperature, dry chamber. After 30 days, 60 days, that means one month interval, we took the antioxidant data of each tea. Mm. But we procured the tea from the market from the same batch, same manufacturing date, like this. And our methodology, we studied parameter is total phenol, flavonoid, Proanthocyanin, tanning, reducing power, ferrous, ferrous iron chelating, and DPPH, ABTS scavenging activity, hydrogen peroxide, superoxide, singlet oxygen, peroxynitrogen, like this 15 parameters we choose. And the sample preparation is like that sample powdered extraction in methanol, then centrifuged, like this. And the results is like this. Phenol content, after 120 days, there is a sharp decline in green tea. Remarkable depletion occurred after one, 210 days in black and 180 days in white. That means phenol content decline in green tea is very faster than the other teas. Whereas flavonoid also higher in green tea, after 90 days drop down much and maintain a gradual depletion. Black and oolong teas, they initially have lesser amount, but degradation after 90 days in oolong tea and 120 days in black tea. That means they are running from the lower side than the green tea, black tea, but they retain their flavonoid content much more than the green tea after up to 
120 days in black tea. Proanthocyanin like this, and I after drop after 90 days, oolong tea have highest initial stage, but sharp decline, 60 days. Green tea starts from same amount, decrease from 90 days. Black and white tea initially have lower and minimum amount of depreciation noted. Tannin is higher in white tea, almost having similar initial time after 90 to 50 days, the rate of degradation remarkable. ABTS and DPPH scavenging activity. This scavenging activity, uh, if uh, there are two type of graphs, one is IC50 calculated data is in the right side. And in the left side, there is scavenging activity of the um, ion. Antioxidant ability and their re correspondence value have been analyzed. C50 is the, IC50 is the expression of concentration of extract, which needs scavenge 50% of the radical present in the specific amount of solvent. Free radical scavenging ability has been studied in ABTS and DPPH radical scavenging activity. Percent scavenging activity initially higher in green tea and oolong tea, but depletion rate are almost similar. Efetutulation in black tea is, is similar to the green tea. Reduction of percent chelating ability after 60 days. White tea retain their chelating ability almost same up to 120 days. Okay. Black and green tea shows nearer value, percent scavenging pro, uh, pro, uh, peroxynitrate assay, both decrease after 30 days, like this. Superoxide radical scavenging activity and nitric oxide scavenging activity. In both cases, the green tea showing much more uh, stable condition than the oolong and black. White tea also good, showing good. Nitric oxide also starts, uh, radical scavenging starts almost same from black, green, and white. Though the oolong starts from the lower one, but oolong retains its uh, radical scavenging activity up to mm, two, 10 days rather. HOCL radical scavenging activity more or less starts from the same value in all four types of tea normally and uniformly starts to decline after 210 days. Right. And black and green tea shows hydrogen peroxide radical scavenging assay at the same in, as initial time. Both sharply decline after 150 days. Right. <coughs> Hydroxyl radical scavenging ability is higher in white tea, lowest in oolong tea. Singlet oxygen, that means O2, radical hunting activity is higher in green tea after a gradual depletion, sharp decline recorded after 30, 300 days. Reducing power occur high, higher radical hunting value in green tea at the initial point and lose about 50% ability after 60 days. Experimental results of scavenging assay pointed out after four to six months of preservation, the antioxidant quality all of all three types of tea gradually reduced, except oolong tea, where upholding radical hunting ability have observed for prolonged time than other the three types of tea. That means oolong tea is somehow better uh, having some long life, sh shelf lifetime. This is a statistical pairwise Pearson correlation coefficient based on the matrix depicts that black tea, maximum secondary metabolites were highly correlated with the different <laughs> antioxidant capacities. Ion chelation, iron chelation and superoxide radical scavenging activity had weak correlation with phenol and flavonoid. 
in green tea, especially flavonoid and tannin were high. Except DPPH and nitric oxide radical scavenging activity had weak correlation with pro and pro anthocyanidin. Similarly, in white tea, in oolong tea, the correlation of the um, uh, different antioxidant element. To determine the self life of four type of proposed tea, 15 antioxidant parameter we have chosen. To estimate the shelf life, their antioxidant activity, that is major health benefit attributed, attribute have been estimated. The decline percentage of each and individual parameter in uh, after definite interval have calculated like these. Decline percentage is equal to A0 minus AN divided by A0 into 100, where A0 is assessed antioxidant value at that initial time and AN is the after definite interval. The mean declination percentage of for 15 studies parameters have considered as predicted value of shelf life. In regression analysis, predicted is dependent variable and the independent variable is the storage time. Best fit curve has been extrapolated and from these credible days up for 25% and 50% declination have been calculated. This is the following calculating result. This is the graphical representation of the declination in black, in green, in oolong and white. Processed tea have considerably long shelf life. Processed tea means the um, black tea is more processed than the other type, uh, three types. For its at least least moisture content due to involve uh, a series of processing steps during manufacturing. After a certain period of storage, different factors like temperature, humidity, microorganism, and tea moisture content causes deterioration of tea quality to a greater extent. Recent report says that compound responsible for the tea health benefit properties like different polyphenol and catechin derivatives are not re restored in stable condition during storage. One of catechin derivative, epigallocatechin gallate, decline one third and epigallocatechin gallate depletes half of their initial content on or before six months of storage. Theoflavin, a potent antioxidant compound of black tea, decreased about 37% and 22% in orthodox and CTC type respectively and uh, after 12 months of storage. In view of the above, we depicted that phenol content is like this green, black, white, oolong. Flavonoid, flavonoid content, black, green, white, oolong. Proanthocyanidin, black, oolong, green, white. If we series, um, categorize this series, uh, overall initial uh, concentration and, acti and activities were almost maintained up to 90 to 120 days. And thereafter, declination starts. After 180 days, rapid declination starts and beyond 330 days, 60 to 75 percent of the initial activity decline according to the our result. The predicted shelf life period maximum days of oolong tea type could be inferred about the above order as much of the antioxidant component least degrade throughout the time, storage time. It is initially noted although black tea contents lower antioxidant value than the green tea, it is less affected by the storage period than the green tea. It is hard to quantify the total antioxidant activity based on single act active component. Therefore, total form of antioxidant act activity has been estimated along the individual radical scavenging property. It is reflected that after a certain time of storage, metal chelating activity of black and green tea drastically declined, whereas the same is steadily maintained by both semi-fermented oolong tea and slightly fermented white tea.
thank you very much if any question is there Thank you so much, Dr. Das. Any questions? Should we uh, move ahead? Okay. Thank you so very much, sir, for the commendable presentation. Uh, round of applause for Dr. Soren Das, everyone. The presentation itself uh, enhanced the recalling value of the term uh, tea that uh, everyone in the house uh, are in the urge of taking some uh, tea or coffee, right? And especially the students uh, sitting over there, uh, they are uh, in the need of some antioxidants because of back-to-back uh, -back sessions. We will definitely go for some uh, tea and uh, coffee networking session. But before that, we have more uh, two speakers. For now, let's welcome Dr. Sagarika Parida. Associate Professor, School of Applied Science, Centurion University, Bhuvaneshwar. A big round of applause for her. And she is talking on exploring the impact of vermicomposting on soil health and growth of triticum estivum L on the organic farming system. We welcome you, ma'am. Good afternoon, good afternoon, one and all present here. I am Dr. Sagarika Parida, Associate Professor, Department of Botany, School of Applied Sciences, Centurion University of Technology and Management, Bhavanishwar Campus. Before going to this topic, exploring the impact of Bhadmi composting on soil health and growth of wheat crop, I would like to say a few lines the motivation behind this work. Actually, one of my cousins uh, was suffering from cancer and advised by the doctors from Tata Memorial Hospitals that he should take uh, wheat grass juice early in the morning. And it was a hectic schedule for his son to grow and to get the leaf every day. And that motivates me to do this work. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So in this experiment, uh, we have grown the uh, wheat seeds in organic farming system. We know that organic farming system, uh, soil health is maintained by organic farming system. And soil health uh, is defined as the capacity of the soil functions, uh, the capacity of soil to function as a living ecosystem. and it can be measured by nutrient, its nutrient contents, its water holding uh, capacity, and also the microorganisms present in it. And this, we know that the soil is a living ecosystem and about 87% of the soil that is sustained uh, in this, sustained all the life forms on this earth, about 39 inches of the soil that sustains the life forms from microorganisms to the human, human system and also plants as certain animals, every living organism sustained uh, on the 39 inches of the deep soil, that uh, soil. Then agricultural soil are invariable, deficient or imbalanced in one or more essential nutrients, mostly because of some ag agricultural practices resulting in reducing the crop yield. 
So these are some of the agronomic practices. Agronomic practices like tillage. Tillage is the preparation of the seedbed and then use of chemical fertilizers and use of pesticides and monocropping. And these uh, pictures I have already, I have uh, collected from the net sources. And these are the agronomic practices that degrade the soil. And other responsible for factors uh, for soil degradation, there are two factors, natural causes and man-made causes. Natural causes, we know that uh, landslides, hurricanes and volcanic eruptions, then man-made causes, urbanization, domestic waste, uh, waste, industrial waste, mining, and radioactive emissions, dam construction, and agricultural waste. So agricultural practices to maintain the soil health and enhancing yield, there are different factors. These are the factors here, reduction in chemical fertilizer use, pesticide management, integrated nutrient management, then foliar fortification, proper tillage operations, mulching. Mulching is the covering of the soil. Um, then uh, residue management, nurturing the rhizosporic region and nano carrier based fertilizer plant growth boosting nanoparticles and use of organic fertilizers or enhancing organic farming system. So we know that organic farming system has positive impact on environment and soil ecosystem and thereby its positive impact also uh, on human health. But organic farming system is criticized for low yielding as a low yielding system. In this study, vermicompost and cow dung compost was applied to observe its impact on growth of the wheat, wheat crop under pot cultivation experiment. So these are my objectives. Impact of vermicompost and cow dung compost on, uh, on soil nutrient status and wheat crop growth and its impact on wheat crop nutrient status. Then uh, we have collected PUSA DBW303 current uh, Vaishnavi variety and vermicompost is collected from the vermicomposting production unit uh, CUTM Bhuvaneshwar campus and a field experiment with wheat cultivars in organic condition was performed in pot cultivation method in February 2022. Then we have taken uh, con pot containing normal soil as control, then soil and cow dung in two is to one proportion, soil and vermicompost in one is to one, and then soil and vermicompost in two is to two, soil in vermicompost in four is to one ratio. And after that, we evaluate the vegetative crop growth in intervals of seven days, 15 days, 25 days, and 35 days after sowing. These are the methodology for collecting the soil samples. So we have uh, first of all cleaned the soil surface and then dig a hole in V shape for soil analysis for um, by XRF technology. And uh, about 15 to 20 centimeter dig we have to uh, we have done uh, in a v-shaped manner and 2 to 2.5 centimeter thick slice of soil was collected from each side of the exposed site of the v-shaped structure and then collection of soil samples from 8 to 10 places the collection soil samples were collected from different places of this campus uh, from the medicinal plant garden. And then all the samples were mixed well. Then after that, two grams of soil samples were sent to ATC laboratory for XRF analysis. Then these soil samples were filled with uh, different propor proportion as suggested earlier uh, in different proportion in different parts. And all the experiments were done uh, thrice, then, sorry. Pre-soaked seeds were sown in raw manner, then raising of seedlings, the wheat seeds were pre-soaked overnight and the uh, it was sown in the soil filled with pods in raw manner and for soil nutrition analysis, X XRF uh, analysis was done 
and growth of the seedlings are measured at regular intervals. So we have studied this uh, uh, soil nutrition, then uh, wheat crop growth, then nutrient contents in wheat leaf. These are the different, uh, my, uh, different nutri nutrients present in soil samples in percentage. That is aluminum oxide dioxide, then silicon oxide, and uh, phosphate, uh, phosphate pentoxide. So these are the different uh, nutrition nutrients present in the soil samples. And out of these, soil and vermicompost in two is to one ratio proved to be the best for the crop growth, wheat crop growth. And these are the some nutritional factor, nutritional composition or nutritional content at PPM level. And nutritional composition in soil and vermicompost uh, showed optimum growth in comparison to uh, other soil composition, uh, also in soil and cow dung compost. And then these are the wheat seedlings. After the first slide, it is after seven days. And then second one, it is after 15 days. And these are uh, soil vermicompost, one is to one ratio, then soil uh, control and two is to one ratio soil is to vermicompost and different uh, proportion of soil, four is to one soil is to vermicompost and soil cow dung. And this last uh, picture is uh, that soil vermicompost two is to one after 35 days of sowing. So these are the growth of the uh, wheat uh, plants, wheat grass. After, uh, after 15 days of sowing and after 25 days of sowing. Average leaf length is maximum in soil vermicompost two is to one ratio and then followed by soil and compost. These are graphical representation of uh, effect of vermicompost and cow dung compost on wheat crop growth in 15 days after sowing. And in table three, Wheat crop growth in control and uh, soil vermicompost after 30, it shows 35, after 35 days the, in soil control, the average plant height is uh, less in comparison to soil and vermicompost. And also uh, average leaf length is also uh, less than the so, soil vermicompost in two is to one ratio. So this, these are the graphical representation. This is uh, nutrient contents in wheat leaf. After 15 days, we have collected the wheat leaf and then uh, uh, we uh, analyze it by XRF uh, analysis. And these are the nutritional composition after 15 days. These are the gra graphs, uh, XRF graphs, showing different nutrients present in the leaf. And this is, these are the elements in leaves from pots, soil and control and soil and vermicompost in two is to one ratio after 15 days of sowing. So for wheat crop application of vermicompost in soil showed better result on crop growth than cow dung compost and other treated soil composition. Soil and vermicompost may have optimum nutrient content for better vegetative growth. Apart from this study, now we are also in continuing uh, that uh, zinc oxide uh, foliar fortification to raise the zinc content of the uh, wheat grass so that it, ca it uh, can be uh, used as the uh, immunity booster because that wheat grass juice is also known as uh, li living juice and also it is known as the uh, green blood and because it has antioxidant activities and also it eliminates the toxic uh, elements from the body and also it has it contains several nutrients like separate vitamins like vitamin a vitamin b B1 to B6, B8, B12, and vitamin C, vitamin E, and vitamin K. So definitely, if we increase the zinc content, now we have also got some results. I have not included here. Uh, we have enhanced the zinc content in the wheat grass, and we can consume the wheat grass juice or the uh, green blood or the uh, living juice 
as a supplementary food to boost our immunity. Thank you. Any question? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For two kg of soil. No, sir. It, I think it depends upon variety because some variety uh, does not show uh, uh, that proper growth in uh, only soil also it does not show any proper growth. It depends upon variety and uh, two is to one, sir. Uh, soil is two, two kg and uh, vermicompost is one. Uh, sir, cardong is also two is to one and vermicompost in different proportion, one is to one, one kg, one Sir, actually, we are generally using, yes, sir. Sir, uh, we are using uh, that uh, uh, cow dung. Generally, we are using cow dung, but here we are, uh, we have uh, produced the, uh, here we have a unit, vermicompost unit, and we are producing that, manufacturing that vermicompost using that plant debris and other organic uh, products and we want to see whether this vermicompost has any positive response towards this uh, germination of the wheat seedling and uh, grass, sweet grass. Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thanks for a nice presentation, madam. Uh, when you said that something is good uh, for your um, soil uh, with the vermicompost as compared to soil and cow dung. So when you are saying something is better, so in terms of statistics, I think it's, it's important. Yes, to sir, we have to include the statistical, the statistical significance. We have to look that uh, we are in the process of other uh, parameter study in the, for okay. other parameters. Okay. We, mm -hmm. have, uh, we have to include that also. And what is the basis of that uh, X-ray fluorescence analysis? I mean, how does how does it work? XRF technology that you said? Yes, sir. XR, in XRF technology, uh, if uh, we can uh, measure all the nutrients present in uh, uh, any substance, in also leaf, also you can measure, and also XRF by, by XRF you can uh, taste the soil samples also. No, what is the principle for that? I mean, how does sir, it work? Um, it? Sir, that uh, uh, okay. I can answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the excellent presentation and also for sharing the story behind your uh, work, the real life uh, inspiration behind your work. We wish you luck, ma'am. Thank you so very much for the excellent presentation. Moving ahead now, let's welcome Dr. Raghunath Satpathi, Assistant Professor of Biotechnology, GM University, Sambalpur. And he is talking on in silico prediction of hub genes and pathways related to osmotic tolerance in Arabidopsis thylena. He is with us virtually. Let's welcome him. Good evening. Uh, am I audible? Yes, very good evening, sir. You are very much audible. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. yeah, let me share my screen. Oh. Is it visible to all? Is it is it visible? Yes, sir. It is visible now. Okay. So, uh, uh, good evening, one and all. So, I am going to talk about uh, say in silico prediction of the hop genes and pathways related to osmotic tolerance in Arabidopsis thalina. Before going to uh, this prediction, let us discuss about some few uh, of the uh, thing like. Uh, concept of the gene expression, as already we know, so DNA codes for the protein uh, through this RNA, 
and basically this coding rna is mrna and that uh, generates or that uh, uh, expresses this particular protein and so protein just one the... second uh, sorry for the interruption uh, yeah. i request you to kindly share the full screen please tap on the full oh, screen button. okay 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 Is it okay now? Uh, yes, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is the coding RNA that gives rise to protein, which is the key player of any kind of process. So, so uh, the gene expression uh, pattern, if you will see, some genes are differentially expressed because there are different cell types, uh, different environmental conditions, developmental phases, disease states, or stress, whatever we say. So there are many conditions. This uh, uh, gene expression uh, are differentially expressed both in animals and plants and uh, any kind of living things. And uh, also the gene expression is primarily regulated at the level of transcription. And this copy number of mRNA is very important. For example, if it is a highly expressed gene, they might have uh, about 10,000 of mRNA. Sometimes it is very less also. So uh, to, uh, to detect or to uh, find out these gene expression things, we are basically using the technique microarray, which is a method for high throughput gene expression profiling involving the hybridization of mRNA to an array of complementary cDNA probes. And this hybridization provides the, uh, generates the intensity of a particular probe, leveled probe, so that expression level that can be computed. This is the uh, very basic uh, technique what we are using in the microarray. There will be a control, there will be experimental, uh, or you can say uh, it's in a stress condition or any uh, treatment, what you can say, treat, uh, treated cell. So uh, this cDNA uh, uh, is to be extracted, mRNA is to be extracted and it is converted to cDNA and level thing. Uh, so that uh, after the hybridization, we can, uh, get some idea about the expression of the gene, which are off-regulated, which are down-regulated, which are constitutively expressed, all these things. So uh, this is the basic thing. What is this application? We can, uh, uh, we can infer many uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, result from this microarray experiment. For example, cell-specific gene expression, what I already discussed, then regulation of gene, how the environmental conditions uh, uh, impose, uh, impact on this expression level of this particular gene, then elucidation of this metabolic pathways, what particular pathways they follow so that uh, this particular uh, gene is expressed. Uh, and uh, there is a uh, server that is called NCBA GEO. So gene expression omnibus, it is a public repository that actually uh, uh, that is uh, that actually stores this micro or experimental data, uh, including the next generation sequencing and other forms. These geo data sets can be uh, used uh, because it provides the high throughput functional genomic data. It supports complete and well annotated data. Uh, it, it is freely uh, available for any users. You can. Uh, uh, you can download and you can uh, study the expression pattern of this uh, particular uh, gene of interest. So there is a tool available in this uh, NCBA GEO, it's GEO2R. It is an interactive web tool that allows the users to compare two or more groups of samples in this GEO series. Okay, there is another database is known as string database. So string is a database of known and predicted protein-protein interactions. These interactions include uh, uh, physical or uh, you know functional associations. Uh, you can predict. It's just a uh, screenshot to show you how these uh, genes are. Then uh, what is a hop gene basically? So hop gene uh, you can see here. Uh, so. Uh, it's basically uh, the gene having many interactions with other genes. So since we have uh, thousands of gene interaction we are studying through microarray study, so it is better to calculate, uh, to uh, predict these hop genes. So because it plays the essential role in gene regulation and a particular biological process. 
So in this present analysis, we have attempted to identify some key genes associated with the osmotic tolerance of this arabidopsis thalina. So for that, we have taken, uh, uh, let me directly go to, so these are certain, uh, uh, what I can say, the, uh, some of the plant genes that is related to, uh, it's already reported to this uh, uh, osmotic stress that is related to osmotic stress. This particular uh, proteins are expressed basically. So in this case, so uh, we basically, you know, we took this, uh, we retrieved the data of a microarray expression profile from NCBIGO. This is the uh, accession number of this uh, uh, particular uh, uh, data, data set of Arabidosis thalina, uh, which was available uh, from uh, April 2020. And uh, the differentially expressed gene we calculated by using GO2R, uh, there is certain uh, condition we kept like uh, the adjusted P value. It is, a, it is available in this expression profile and uh, log fold change, it should be one. So this condition was kept. So those who qualify this particular condition, this is considered by differential expressed genes. We can change the value also uh, for the standard things we have taken that particular thing. Then uh, the protein protein network constructions, uh, we, uh, uh, we selected all this uh, uh, particular uh, gene, whatever obtained from this differential experience gene. Then we uh, took uh, these particular genes were fed to the string server. Um, and there also we selected some score like uh, it's greater than 0 0.7. Uh, for the uh, to uh, to avoid the uh, distance uh, related, I mean genes. Uh, this uh, uh, so we are having very uh, good score. I mean uh, uh, good connection genes will obtain. Then uh, these half genes uh, from this particular result, we have used a uh, uh, another tool, cytoscape, along with a plugin cytohuba. Uh, so that produces this thing. So uh, from the result, we got initially so after first screening 297 differential genes. After screening of the network from the PPI, I mean in string server, uh, we found there are 98 genes and 278 edges uh, of the particular things. And this was uh, fed to this uh, uh, cytoscape and we obtained there are six genes. Uh, uh, particularly, uh, particularly as a hop genes. Uh, these are the uh, thing. Uh, so these are the uh, relationship uh, between these particular interactions uh, of these particular genes. And if you see the, uh, we have annotated uh, what is the function of this particular gene. Uh, these are having different functions like uh, it's some, um, uh, for example, NUD T7, uh, the Nordic hydrolase is responsible for hydrolysis of these phosphates. Then CBP60G, it is a calamdelin binding uh, protein. Then WRKY3, it is a, uh, it is already reported in the, uh, as a, uh, its function as a defense response. Then you are having uh, again calamdelin like proteins. Then uh, syntaxins are also there, the vesicle, uh, vesicle trafficking protein, then leucine rich repeat receptors. There is also a, uh, that is a, that is called Sobir1. Uh, Sobir it is a interact, uh, this is a counter player or inhibitor of this particular um, uh, kinase. So in this way, these six, uh, 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 I mean, genes uh, or the, uh, uh, was found as this, uh, were found uh, as the hop genes for these things. So these are related to the osmotic stress. So presently the work is going on uh, to calculate their, their physical interaction by protein-protein docking and uh, how they uh, actually interacting uh, to each other. So that uh, we can uh, reconstruct the pathway uh, for this protein content. So these are some of the reference and uh, thank you for this thing. Thank you so much, sir. 
can we take some questions yes please, yes, please. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So in the microarray that you did, normally um, uh, you did the microarray to see the down and up expression of a lot of genes over there. Yes. So for the um, validation, normally it is to be followed with some qrt PCR experiment also, because uh, when we do microarray, what I know, you need to do some rt PCR to for the confirmation of those kind of genes to be up, up regulated or down regulated. Uh, actually uh, actually it is a it is an in silico work we have already taken the data set that is already available in the database of okay. these things we have not verified okay that is the thing okay thank you it's just to check uh, uh, what are the these hop genes and uh, currently we are doing the protein protein docking these things is going on how physically they interact okay, okay. thank you so much thank you sir Thank you, thank you, Dr. Satpathi, for the commendable presentation. This was the last presentation of the day. Here we come to the end of day one. I would request all of you to kindly join in the inaugural session and for the cultural session. Thank you so much, everyone, for your patience hearing. Thank you, all the speakers, and uh, especially the students present over here. See you in the cultural session. Thank you so much. Yeah.